I'm calling to order this uh, meeting. This is a uh, regular meeting of the Council of the District of Columbia, the second legislative meeting of Council Period 20. I'm Phil Mendelson, Chairman of the Council. Today is Tuesday, February 5th, 2013. The time is 10.48 in the morning. We are in room 500, the Council Chamber, the Johnny Wilson Building. Uh, the first item of our legislative meetings is a, a moment of silence. If we could have a moment of silence, please. Thank you very much. Will the secretary uh, determine a quorum? Councilmember Alexander? Here. Councilmember Barry? Here. Councilmember Bonds? Here. Councilmember Bowser? Councilmember... Councilmember Catania? Here. Councilmember Che? Here. Councilmember Evans? Here. Councilmember Graham? Here. Councilmember Grosso? Here. Councilmember McDuffie? Here. Chairman Mendelson? Present. Councilmember Orange? Here. Councilmember Wells? Here. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if there's no objection, I'm going to take out of order uh, item 7A, which is the ceremonial resolutions on the consent agenda. I'm going to do that because at this time, because we have a presentation of two ceremonial resolutions, one of which is on the consent agenda. So if there's no objection, what we have before us is item 7A, the um, reading and vote on proposed ceremonial resolutions. First, I'll ask if anybody wants to remove anything from the, that portion of the consent agenda. Hearing nothing. Uh, then um, 7A, all those in favor of approving the ceremonial resolutions on the consent agenda say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Uh, now we will turn to a presentation by Councilmember Che of the American Heart Month Recognition Resolution of 2013. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Last Friday, February 1st, marked the 10th anniversary of the National Wear Red Day. <laughs> the day dedicated to raising awareness about heart disease, the number one killer of women and men in America. Since the full council is convening today for a legislative session, we're wearing red here in the Wilson Building and presenting this resolution to the American Heart Association in honor of the victims uh, of heart disease and stroke and to support expanded uh, research uh, for these uh, ailments. Most risk factors for heart disease, including high blood pressure, high cholesterol, physical inactivity, obesity, and smoking are preventable and controllable. Controlling these risk factors is the key to reducing your risk of a heart attack by 80%. So just by taking some steps every day to reduce our risk for heart disease and wearing red at work, like we're doing, we can spread the word and get others uh, to join us. The resolution being passed today, uh, that has passed now, the, that we had the vote, proclaims February as Heart Month in the District of Columbia and encourages all residents and agencies to go red. Before we uh, read the resolution, uh, I want to, um, on behalf of all the members of the council, uh, to uh, invite everyone to a challenge. Uh, and those who are watching at home also, We'd like you to encourage your office and your uh, family and your networks and people you know to participate throughout the month of February by joining the America Goes Red Challenge. It's really easy and potentially could save a life. Remind people that we can do things as simple as taking stairs instead of taking the elevator, to walk uh, to, to, for errands or ride your bike. And you can find more information at goredforwomen.org the Wear Red Day Challenge, but we can start on our own. We know how to uh, use our legs instead of um, an elevator. So we want to raise awareness about this number one killer, and we want to raise awareness in particular about how it affects women. And before we read and present the resolution, I would like to uh, invite um, the women uh, on the council 
uh, Councilmember Alexander, Councilmember Bonds, and Councilman, Councilmember Bowser, if they would like to say a few words. So there you go. Thank you. Good morning. Notice the red. Notice the red. <laughs> we care about um, men's hearts, too. Uh, but this is to acknowledge, so we want the men to take care of themselves too. But this is to acknowledge that it's really, it's really eye-opening and we need to bring awareness because a lot of people don't um, correlate women to heart disease. They mostly hear about men with heart disease and approximately um, one woman every minute in this country dies of heart disease. So we really do need to bring awareness to that. February is known as the month for love and giving of your heart. Well, we want February to be acknowledged to protect your heart as well. So we really need to bring awareness. When you see red uh, across the city today and this month, think about your heart. Take care of yourself. We can't educate uh, the public enough of the factors that can cause heart disease. And we are going to commit. I'm going to commit to walking 30 minutes a day. And I challenge everyone in Ward 7, if they're listening, to walk 30 minutes every day. So thank you, Council Member Che, for your leadership in this role, and thank the American Heart Association. Thank you, Council Member Alexander. And to my male colleagues, we love you. You know that. <laughs> but uh, it has been a, uh, an underattended problem for women to relate the problem of heart disease with women. And many women go uh, without seeking help. Many women die when they shouldn't. And many women suffer in ways that we're not fully um, aware of. And if we raise the awareness, what we want to do is, is protect women as well. Councilmember Bonds. Thank you, um, Councilwoman Shea, for your leadership on this very, very important um, issue. As a woman, I'm concerned. I have um, family members that have succumbed to heart disease, and I'm sure you can point to your own situation. This is such a serious um, issue to wear such a bright color on behalf of. But wearing the bright color is to call the attention to something very, very important, our own health. And heart disease, number one, concern across America. I hope we'll take this to, f to fate and we'll abide. Walking, <laughs> well, walking, walking is important, but there are so many other things that we need to do to assure that we will have better health. And I hope the District of Columbia, one of the areas of the country that really does not do well with managing its health will understand that this bright red color is worn for your heart, for you to protect your heart and to do better for you, your neighbors, and your friends. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilmember Bowser. Very quickly, I just want to thank everybody who's bringing this issue to our attention. We have the nurses who are also here in red today and concerned about our health. And I'm glad that the ladies promoting our, our Wear Red Day caught me walking up the steps this morning. Uh, so I, I feel good about that. Um, and I, I can't echo uh, enough what has already been said about the need for us to get moving and stay moving, even in the regular activities of our day. We have started what I call, council member, the 5K a month club. Um, and that some of us every month are picking a race to run or walk in um, every month uh, to get moving. I think uh, Catania told me he was going to join me uh, one month, so maybe in March uh, that will work. But thank you. We are heavily invested in this city in making sure everybody can have access to insurance. So not just in an emergency when you're feeling sick, but every month uh, or every six months or every year to check in with your doctor and make sure everything is okay, even when you're feeling okay, um, because that's when you can stay ahead of these issues. We have too many women and men in our city dying from preventable diseases. So let's get to preventing them. Thank you very much. And now what I'd like to do, I'd, I'd like to uh, read the resolution because the resolution whereas is uh, will actually, I think, in some 
ways uh, perhaps uh, shock some people in terms of the statistics that we have. Um, whereas the American Heart Association Go for Red for Women movement has been affecting the health of women for 10 years and more than 627,000 women's lives have been saved and 330 fewer women are dying every day, whereas heart disease is the number one killer of women, it's the number one killer of women, Yet only one in five American women believe that heart disease is her greatest health threat. Whereas cardiovascular diseases cause one in three women's death e each year, killing approximately one woman every minute. Whereas while progress has been significant in reducing deaths from heart disease, it is still the number one killer of women and men. Whereas uh, cardiovascular diseases are the nation's leading cause of death and the costliest disease with direct and indirect cost estimated to be over $312 billion. Whereas between 1999 and 2009, the rate of death from cardiovascular diseases fell 32.7%, but still accounted for nearly one in three deaths in the nation. Whereas heart disease alone is the leading cause of death in the district, accounting for 722 female deaths in 2012 whereas stroke is the number three cause of death for females in the district, accounting for 138 female deaths in 2012, whereas heart disease and stroke account for a third of all female deaths in the district, whereas on average nearly two women die from heart disease and stroke in the district every day, whereas an estimated 43 million women in the United States are affected by cardiovascular diseases, whereas 90% of women have one or more risk factors for developing heart disease, whereas women comprise only 24% of participants in all heart-related studies. You see the disparity there? Whereas since 1984, more women than men have died each year from heart disease, and the gap between men and women's survival continues to widen. Whereas women are less likely to call 911 for themselves when experiencing symptoms of a heart attack than they are if someone else were experiencing such symptoms. Whereas by increasing awareness, speaking up about heart disease, empowering women to reduce their risk for cardiovascular disease, and recognizing the critical importance um, of tools and skills that will increase survival rates from cardiac arrest, and incorporating those tools, thousands of lives can be saved each year. Whereas efforts of the American Heart Association encourage citizens to save lives by calling 911 if symptoms occur, become trained in CPR and encourage comprehensive automated external defibrillator programs in their communities. And the council has done work in that area too by requiring them to be put, for example, in uh, recreational uh, facilities and we're, we have further legislation on that coming forward. Whereas efforts of the American Heart Asso Association encourage citizens um, uh, to be active and the American Heart Association is celebrating February 2013 as American Heart Month and promoting education and awareness by encouraging citizens to learn the warning signs of heart attack and stroke, resolved by the Council of the District of Columbia that this resolution may be cited as the American Heart Month Resolution of 2013. And I, I'd like to present this resolution on behalf of the Council, um, and I'm going to call up uh, Jennifer Witten and Roxana Horveda uh, of the American Heart Association if they are here. Um, but um, are they here for the resolution? But before. Before, before we, uh, act, as they're working their way up here, um, you know, in a spirit of um, non-discrimination, I would like to invite any of the male colleagues on the faculty <laughs> if they want to make any comments. Does anyone? Mr. Chairman? No? Okay. We love you guys. <laughs> oh, I I'm sorry? We actually have other representations of the American Heart Association. Okay, well, uh, why don't you tell me uh, who's actually going to receive this? Okay, and oh, Joy and Gail, okay, Gail Harris-Berry and Joy Dorsey. Dorsey, and if you would take that, we would like to present this to you on behalf of the council. Thank you so very much. And thank you. I think the hat is the best, don't you think the hat's great? Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much. I would like to thank on behalf of the American Heart Association, uh, Council Member Che, for bringing forth this resolution and for the council members for your support in celebrating American Heart Association Go Red throughout February. 
Uh, we are so excited to have a citywide effort. My name is Joy Dorsey. I'm Chief Compliance Officer at PEPCO, and I'm a proud member of the Greater Washington Region American Heart Association Board. And more importantly, I'm over a 25-year member resident of Washington, D.C. So I'm particularly proud of what this council has done for us today. I'm proud to say my company, PEPCO, went red on National Wear Red Day this past Friday, and our employees throughout our corporation literally wore their support for this on their sleeve. For 10 years, PEPCO have been fighting, women have been fighting for heart disease individually and together for, with the Go Red for Women movement. 627,000 women's lives have been saved, but the fight is far from over. Heart disease is still our number one killer, as you have said so well today, Council Member Chave. But the strength of the women, the mothers, the sisters, the daughters, the friends, and the men who love us are more powerful than any killer. So together we will fight this very important battle. And with the effort that's made here and continuing throughout our months and days and years ahead, we will continue to have such results as what we've already experienced. 90% of women have made at least one healthy change in their behavior. More than one-third have lost weight, and more than 50% have increased their exercise, as we've seen by Council Member Bowser. Uh, this movement will continue to ensure and in increasing our health. Together, we will end heart disease. Thank you again for your partnership. Thank you for your support, Council, and thank you, everyone, the community, for making this vital effort a success. Thank you all. We will now turn to the uh, second uh, ceremonial resolution that's being presented. Uh, Mr. Evans, uh, you are presenting the Friendship Collegiate Academy 2012 DC Statewide Athletic Association Champion Recognition Resolution of 2012. Mr. Evans. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And I'm very pleased to be here today to present this uh, ceremonial resolution to the Friendship uh, Collegiate Academy's varsity football team who have joined us over here on the right. And so, uh, yeah, so can you guys come all up and join us? Somehow we're going to get everybody in here. Come on up and bring the trophy with you, too. <laughs> Thank you. Come on up. Just push these guys out of the way behind me. <laughs> Come on, guys. We'll get everybody up. Put the trophy. Bring the trophy over here. See, when, they, when the women tried to exclude the men, I just thought I'd bring a lot of men with me this time. <laughs> can we can move on this side, too. Can we get? Come on, we can go over on this side here. Yeah. Well, this is a great event, and uh, I'm very pleased we could have the team with us today uh, for this ceremonial resolution. So <clears throat> I'm going to read the resolution because it will explain the exploits of this great football team uh, today following upon uh, the victory in the Super Bowl on Sunday by the Baltimore Ravens. Now, they're not the Washington Redskins, but they're pretty close. So uh, I want to congratulate the Baltimore Ravens on their excellent victory in the uh, Super Bowl. It's a team very close to our heart. And hopefully next year uh, it'll be the Washington Redskins versus the Baltimore Ravens. Wouldn't that be a... Uh, and, you know, we could have done it. If our G3 had, had remained healthy, we would have been there. Um, okay, the resolution to recognize and honor the Friendship Collegiate Academy's varsity football team and congratulate it on its 2012 stellar season, which 2011, 12, 2012, excuse me, stellar season, which included an appearance on ESPN as well as recognition for two first team members, one second team member, and three honorable mention team members on the Washington Post 2012 All Metropolitan Team. 
whereas Friendship Collegiate Academy's football program began in 2004 with Azir Abdul Rahim as its first and still only varsity football head coach. Now, if the name sounds familiar, it's because he is the son of a person who has been with me my entire time on the council, and that is Wendy Abdul Rahim, his mother over here. And give her a big round of applause. Who has how many sons? Six sons, all very successful, so we're uh, very pleased. Uh, whereas Friendship Collegiate Academy's football program, I just read that, began in 2004. Friendship Collegiate Academy's football program has grown over the years and today boasts over 150 players, enough to field a freshman team, a JV team, and a varsity team. And whereas Friendship's football team may be considered the best high school football team in D.C. proper, finishing number seven in the Washington Post's all Met sports top 20 teams. And whereas although Friendship's Collegiate Academy's athletic teams are sanctioned by D.C. public schools and its players must abide by the same eligibility rules that apply to those other schools, Friendship is kept out of the city's traditional public school league, the D.C. Interscholastic Athletic Association with no bid to the Turkey Bowl, the traditional Thanksgiving game that allegedly crowns the best public school football squad in the city. And whereas friendship is not without many challenges, including no league, no home field, no practice field to call its own, and not even a locker room. Yet despite all of these challenges, friendship's football team did not let obstacles deter it from success, posting a record of nine wins, one loss in the season. And whereas friendship's football team is a scholarship gold mine with many young men receiving scholarship opportunities and signing letters of intent with schools across the country. In 2010, 14 young men received scholarships in 20, 2009, 11. And whereas friendship's football team serves as an example of what can be accomplished with little and how dreams can come true through dedication, persistence, and hard work. Resolution concludes as follows. The Council of the District of Columbia recognizes Coach Abdul Rahim on establishing the Friendship Collegiate Academy's football program in 20, 2004, congratulates him on a job well done during this stellar winning football season, and declares today, February 5th, as Friendship Collegiate Academy 2012 Varsity Football Team Day in the District of Columbia. Go Knights. Congratulations. <laughs> and now I'd like to invite the ward council member uh, where friendship is located, council member Alexander. Thank right. you. And, and council member Barry wants to say something too. He always wants to say something. <laughs> but in Ward 7, I just want to say on behalf of Ward 7, Coach Rahim and the fabulous team, Friendship Collegiate Academy, the Knights, congratulations. You are a true star in Ward 7, and you make us look even brighter in Ward 7. I wanted to take this opportunity, the gentleman over here, and I don't know why he's not up here, Donald Hentz, who is the founder and CEO of Friendship Collegiate. Let's give him a hand. And, and these guys... These guys are stars on and off the field. Let me tell you what's so impressive to me about Friendship Collegiate. For one, they don't have a home field, as you mentioned. And we're going to get them that home field. Isn't that right, guys? You all are going to get a home field, and we're working on that now. But what's so impressive to me is that every year when I attend the graduation, when you look at all these young scholars, Every single student is accepted to a college or a university upon graduation. Let's give that a hand. So they're not only athletes, they are scholars. Continue with your success. And these guys are really bigger than they were sitting down. I'm really impressed. <laughs> but continue with your success on and off the field. And on behalf of Ward 7, congratulations. Very proud of you. And now we'll hear from Mayor Councilmember Barry. <laughs> it's always Mayor Barry. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. The reason I wanted to uh, say some more and congratulate these outstanding athletes and scholars. Uh, it's not easy now in the District of Columbia public school system or charter school system to have this kind of outstanding scholars. And so so I want to give them a round of applause. Come on, all of them. And secondly, 
Uh, I've known Donald Hens for a long time, and he's operating Anacostia. So Donald, we we'll get we want Anacostia to be number one team next year too, right? <laughs> <laughs> and also, he's doing a great job. We have a, a elementary academy in Wood Eight, and so I want to just add my voice, but more importantly, to see so many outstanding young athletes who are African American. So the African American boys in this city uh, catch hell. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can we get a picture? Where's uh, Coach? Where's the coach? Where are you? Where is he? <laughs> we have over here. Oh, there you are, man. No, no, no. I just didn't see you over here. Bring the trophy can over here. Can I get up with the coach, please? Yeah, no. Come on, Yvette. Get up there somehow. You're picking up your dog. Put the trophy up here. Can you move over? <laughs> get Yvette up here. <laughs> But you weren't playing on the team. I probably. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> uh, I want to just thank a few, more than a few people. Uh, this has been a 10-year journey that uh, I think we, we're just kind of getting started. So uh, I want to first uh, thank uh, the City Council for having us down here. Let's give all the council members and uh, a round of applause for, for having us down here. Uh, I want to thank our founder, Donald Hintz over there, who who actually started football, who, who definitely allowed us to uh, start a football program. I want to thank Clark Ray, who's who's in charge of uh, DCSAA. Uh, we weren't allowed to play for any championship until this year, so I mean, I, it's great that we won it. But we actually, you know, through his tireless efforts, we had the uh, opportunity to play for a city championship. I want to thank our coaches who don't get recognized as much as myself, but Coach Hunter is over here, and we have we have a wonderful staff that works with these young men year round. Uh, we're having a signing day, so I mean, I definitely we're grateful and and ecstatic that we're able to win our first championship. But it's never been our goal to win championships at Friendship. It's been our goals to create student athletes and for them to be exceptional young men and graduate from college. Uh, we, we're fortunate where uh, we're fortunate the last five years we'll have 70 kids that have accepted a, a, s some form of athletic scholarship the last five years. We had 19 kids signed last year, and we're going to have actually 20 kids signing tomorrow on signing day. So that's our true championship. That's, that's our true championship. You know, when we started this program strictly because the kids in the community that we, that we service didn't have a lot of opportunities. Everybody wants to go to college, and for sure, all kid, everyone needs to understand that everybody wants to go to college. But a lot of finances really deter a lot of kids from 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 uh, attending college and graduating. So when you take that out of the out of the uh, situation, then a lot of kids graduate, and we actually got a great stand up boy. <laughs> He graduated from Friendship. He was on our first football team. He was on our first football team nine years ago. Yeah. And so I just want to thank everybody. I want to definitely thank my mother. I always do. Love that woman over there. And uh, thank you. Thank you for having us. Okay, congratulations. All right. Okay. All right, thanks, guys.
thought he was one. All right, we are going to uh, continue with the meeting. Uh, again, um, congratulations to the uh, Friendship Collegiate Academy uh, for their championship. Uh, we will now proceed to item five on the agenda, which is the uh, Secretary's report, and I will turn to uh, Councilmember McDuffie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to waive the reading of the Secretary's report. Is there any discussion on the motion to waive reading of the report? All those in favor? The motion to waive say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Uh, we now have the um, Secretary's report of introductions. Before I turn to Mr. McDuffie, I want to note that uh, Bill 20-92, which is the Capitol Hill Business Improvement District Amendment Act of 2013, is going to be re-referred. And so the um, report is before us with that um, uh, caveat with regard to Bill 20-92. Mr. McDuffie? Move to waive the reading of the Secretary's log of introductions. Uh, discussion on the motion to waive. All those in favor of the motion to waive the reading of the Secretary's report of introductions say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Uh, we now have introduction by members on the dais. Uh, sure. I have an introduction. I'm going to go first. Uh, I think Mr. Chairman. Evans. Yes. Um, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Orange. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. All right, I believe I've got everybody. Um, I'm going to begin with the introduction of a bill that I'm actually co-introducing with, uh, I believe, eight other members, and it is the uh, Patients Patient Protection Act of 2013. And this uh, bill is being uh, co-introduced with Councilmember Alexander, Councilmember Berry, Councilmember Bonds, Councilmember Evans, Councilmember Graham, Councilmember Grasso, Councilmember McDuffie, and Councilmember Orange. Uh, this bill addresses a growing concern with regard to the quality of health care that's available to patients in hospitals. And what this bill does is it establishes um, minimum nurse-to-patient hospital, hospital ratios at all times, specific by unit, 
augmented with additional staffing based on individual patient need. The bill also institutes whistleblower protection for nurses and other health care workers who report unsafe conditions. And the bill also bans mandatory overtime for nurses, a dangerous practice that can lead to medical errors. Uh, in short, what this bill does is uh, establish minimum standards so that there's always an adequate number of nurses available to provide patient care. It will, as a result, reduce the incidence of medical errors. It will eliminate burnout that we hear of often with regard to nurses uh, who feel overworked and um, are overworked. Uh, it will reduce uh, the need for overtime and uh, it will, uh, in short, improve quality of care. In the end, uh, what we care most about uh, from a government perspective, which is one of public health, is that patients who need health care receive quality health care. It's not just simply about matching a patient to a bed, but matching a patient to quality health care. If, uh, if uh, we had a press conference yesterday, there was one person who, who spoke, who talked about her personal experience uh, delivering, uh, delivering birth to her child and a, um, with a uh, postpartum unit that was understaffed with nurses. And as a result, uh, she had to wait a long period of time when her infant needed help. Uh, she felt that that actually uh, had some adverse consequences. It took several months to resolve and the need for specialists because of inadequate staffing. Inadequate staffing because there weren't enough nurses on duty, uh, because of a shortage, or because uh, nurses are um, uh, forced to work long shifts, including overtime, and therefore are not um, as good in the 12th or 14th hour as they would be in the first hour. I mean, we've seen this over and over again with regard to health care, including the area of emergency medical services provided by this government, that overtime is not good for quality health, and uh, this bill addresses that indirectly by establishing these minimum uh, standards. Uh, let me, in the moment, seconds left, turn to uh, Councilmember Alexander, who's chair of the Health Committee. If you want to say anything with regard to this bill, this introduction. I, I'm uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think all was said yesterday uh, at the press conference, but we are really, uh, really excited and really pleased um, with the leadership from the Nurses Association. And it just makes sense. Our, our residents of the District of Columbia, uh, their safety and their health is what's most important to us. So this measure is really important. I look forward to the upcoming hearing uh, to hear testimony from so many people that spoke so eloquently and passionately about this legislation. So I'd like to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership on this issue, and I look forward to holding a hearing very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Alexander. Are there co-sponsors for the bill? Mr. Chair, I'll co-sponsor. Uh, Mr. Wells is a co-sponsor, and Councilmember uh, um, Council Barry? I believe you're co-introducer. Yes. Uh, further co-sponsors? All right, this uh, measure will be referred to the Committee on Health. Um, Councilmember Evans for introductions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, today I have three introductions. I'll begin with the first, which is the um, public school librarians, art teachers, music teachers, and PE, Physical Education Teachers Act of 2013. Um, I'm introducing this bill today that, that notwithstanding any other provision of the law, each District of Columbia public school shall have a full-time librarian, art teacher, music teacher, and physical education teacher. Um, given the fact that we spend as a city $2 billion in the education cluster, upwards of eight to $900 million on our public school system, um, it's dispiriting to hear that when our school system opened this September, 58 of our schools opened without an art teacher, a music teacher, a physical education teacher, and a librarian. All across the city when I speak, people are enormously, parents are enormously concerned about this. Um, and so in discussions with the public school system, I still can't get a commitment that each school every school in our city will have these four basic persons in charge of these areas. So I'm introducing this bill today to mandate that every school in the District of Columbia, when it opens next September, 
has an art teacher, a librarian, a music teacher, and a physical education teacher. We are spending far too much money to not have these available for our children. So I'd like to introduce this today, uh, Mr. Chairman. Are there, um... Thank you, Mr. Evans. Are there uh, co-sponsors? Councilmember Orange, Councilmember Bonds, Councilmember Graham, Councilmember Barry, Councilmember McDuffie, Councilmember Grasso, Councilmember Alexander. We can afford this measure it. will be referred to the Committee on Education. Uh, further, Mr. Evans? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The sex, second, <coughs> excuse me, second bill I'm introducing is a sense of the Council in support of the expansion of the Metro Rail System Resolution of 2013. Um, this sense of the Council supports the um, Metro Rail System's recent announcement. The Metro System has served the metropolitan Washington area well since its inception in 1976, helping to transport our residents and workers while reducing the number of cars on the roads. I believe the Council should recognize and support Momentum, which is the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority's strategic plan for 2013 through 2025, which calls for a significant expansion to the system at a cop capital cost of $26 billion. The original Metro Rail system was paid for by allocating half the cost to the federal government, and the other half was allocated equally to Virginia, Maryland, and the District of Columbia in equal shares. Uh, I believe the Council should support this formula and make it clear that we stand ready to commit our funds to contribute our share while calling on the federal government, Maryland and Virginia, to do the same. Just a couple of commentaries. If one thinks of the formula, that the federal government pays for half and then we split the other half with Maryland, Virginia and District of Columbia, we are paying for one out of every six dollars to construct the system and we have the majority of stops in our city. That is the best bargain anyone can get and it's very unfortunate that it was allowed to expire when the uh, 103 mile system was completed. Uh, what Metro has put out is a very bold plan to build new inner city lines, new tunnels, and expand the system because it is almost at capacity. Uh, when people ride the Metro today, there are very few cars that aren't filled, um, and it, it really needs to be expanded. When I uh, was chairman of the Board of Metro twice, back in 94 and 97, I had the opportunity to travel, went to Paris, which I think has the finest Metro system in the world. There's no place in Paris that's more than 300 yards away from a metro stop. And you can ride anywhere for the equivalent of a dollar. What makes public transportation work is convenience and cost. And that's what we don't have in the District of Columbia and the metropolitan area. We need convenience so that everyone can get to a stop and a low cost so you can ride it quickly and efficiently. What Metro has proposed here, uh, I believe, does that. Now, secondly, we were the first when the Tom Davis bill, I'll refer to it, where he proposed the federal government putting in $1.5 billion and then the other three jurisdictions matching that. We were the first to step up to the plate and said, we'll put our money in. And it takes off the table the argument that Maryland and Virginia always want to make is the district will never pay. And that's why I think we should commit today to saying we'll pay our share if everybody else will. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm pleased to uh, introduce this bill today as well. The sense of the council. Are there um, co-sponsors? Uh, Councilmember Orange, Councilmember Bowser, Councilmember Che, Councilmember Bonds, Councilmember uh, Alexander, Councilmember Grasso, Councilmember Barry, Councilmember McDuffie. Uh, this measure will be referred to the Committee on Economic Development. Further, Mr. Evans? Finally, Mr. Chairman, Washington, D.C. used to be known as the City of Trees. And then over a long period of time, the trees began to disappear. If you look at the aerial shots of Washington back in the 30s and 40s, covered with trees. But then you look at them from the 90s and beyond, you looks like half of the tree canopy disappeared. Over the last 10 years, if there was something to do with trees in the city, whether it was planting, inventorying, or learning, the organization known as Casey Trees was involved. What you may not know is that Mrs. Betty Brown Casey originated and championed this idea for a program to restore the ever-decreasing population of trees in the District of Columbia. Ten years ago, Mrs. Casey endowed the Casey Trees organization with $50 million. 
and not only funding, but also through gifting her 600-acre farm in Virginia to establish in perpetuity a site to grow the trees for the District of Columbia. And so all across the city, for 10 years now, we've been planting trees and restoring the tree canopy to what it was 50 years ago. So today, I would like to introduce this legislation to uh, declare the Casey Tree Day Establishment Act of 2013, which would permanently designate the first day of spring, whatever that day happens to be today, it's uh, March 20th, it's usually the 20th or the 21st, but whatever the first day of spring is, officially as Casey Tree Day in the District of Columbia. So I'd like to introduce this at this time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Evans. Are there co-sponsors? Councilmember Catania, Councilmember Grasso, Councilmember Alexander, Councilmember McDuffie, Councilmember Graham, Councilmember Che, Councilmember Bowser, Councilmember Orange, Councilmember Bonds. This measure will be referred to the Committee of the Whole. Councilmember Orange for introductions. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today I'm introducing, along with Councilmember Jack Evans, the Ivy City Tour Bus Parking Restriction Amendment Act of 2013. Both of us. Uh, the bill would prohibit the parking of tour buses at Cromwell School. Ivy City is located along New York Avenue, which is an area with a high volume of traffic, which has resulted in large amounts of smog and air pollution. This has neg negatively impacted the health and well-being of Ivy City residents. Parking multiple diesel fuel buses in this neighborhood will only continue to lower the quality of life for Ivy City residents. For too long, Ivy City has been a dumping ground. The residents along with the administration should be working to turn the Cromwell School into a community center as originally planned. The administration should be working to find suitable solutions. This bill provides that suitable alternative. There's a parking lot located at 1880 V Street Northwest it's owned by Mark Park, who's indicated that they would love to house the buses at this particular location. At 1880 V Street Southwest, this lot can accommodate up to 550 cars and 200 plus uh, coach buses. So uh, this would be an opportunity for us to solve this problem that's been going on for a very long time. When I served as a council member for Ward 5, I had introduced legislation to turn Alexandria Cromwell School into an educational think tank. Uh, I recall during that time also the owner of Love at the time was Mark Barnes, who did renderings to, to show how a community center uh, could be very uh, beneficial to the community uh, at that time. And so this has been going on for at least a decade, and now that we have presented a suitable alternative to solve the uh, the parking issues as a result of the Union Station uh, development, uh, we would hope that the administration would work with the citizens of Ward 5, in particular Ivory City, to address this issue. Now I'd like to offer Councilmember Jack Evans the opportunity to speak to this matter if he so desires. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Council Member Orange, and I'm pleased to join with you today to introduce this uh, piece of legislation uh, that will really, really benefit uh, the residents of Ivy City. Um, tour buses are important in the District of Columbia. Tour buses uh, bring tourists, obviously, which is uh, our second largest industry after the federal government and actually soon will pass the federal government. However, tour buses can be an enormous, enormous impediment uh, on a neighborhood if parked there. They um, tend to run idle, give off exhaust fumes, and become uh, a real blight. Um, we have worked over the years to try and find places for tour buses to go. Um, I introduced and I was responsible for getting legislation passed that required tour buses to not idle, that after several minutes they have to turn off their engines, five minutes have to turn off their engines, and uh, to really reduce the negative impact they have on neighborhoods. But to put them all in one neighborhood I think would be a real mistake, so I'm glad to join with you, uh, Council Member Orange. Mr. Chairman, we would uh, ask for uh, co-sponsors. Are there co-sponsors for this uh, legislation? Uh, Mr. Graham. Uh, section 2 of this bill, uh, ordinarily I wouldn't uh, break up like this, but uh, they're very different. Section 2 will be referred to the Committee on Transportation and the Environment, and Section 3 will be referred to the Committee on Education. Further, Mr. Orange? 
Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, today I'm also uh, introducing, along with Councilmember Jack Evans, the sense of the council supporting Mayor Gray's and Congresswoman Norton's efforts to maintain the FBI headquarters in the District of Columbia. The FBI headquarters has been located in the district since 1908. It is important the administration does whatever it can to keep the headquarters in the district and for the legislative body to support that effort. Maryland and Virginia, through their local and federal elected officials, are making a strong case to move the FBI headquarters to their localities. The Council should wholeheartedly support Mayor Gray's and Congresswoman, Congresswoman Norton's effort to maintain the FBI, FBI headquarters in the district, and we need to raise the volume of noise to let, us, let them know that we are part of this equation as well. There are many locations in the district that could be examined for the FBI headquarters to relocate to, such as uh, the St. Elizabeth's campus, Buzzards Point over in Ward 6, uh, Walter Reed Army Medical Center, or the uh, Farmers Market over in, in Ward 5. And I'm, I'm sure once we do a thorough search, there are other areas as well. It is clear that Maryland and Virginia lack the transportation infrastructure to properly support the new FBI headquarters. On top of all the employees that come to the district on a daily basis to the FBI headquarters, the headquarters also attracts in excess of 500,000 tourists a year, which is a boost to the District of Columbia economy. And finally, the council, council should support the administration's efforts in developing a plan for the potential use of the current location of, of the FBI headquarters that would be most beneficial to the district. The development could have a significant positive impact on a district's economy. At this time, I would like to defer to Councilmember Evans for any comments that he may want to make. Thank you, Councilmember Orange. Um, I wholeheartedly support this idea and pleased to uh, introduce this with you. And um, a little background. The FBI headquarters was built on Pennsylvania Avenue back in uh, the early 70s in the Joseph Stalin style of architecture. It is a monolithic, ugly building, voted the ugliest building in America, believe it or not. Um, the FBI has resisted any efforts to um, have a more inviting building. At one time, we proposed having uh, uh, cafes or putting artwork on it, and they've resisted all efforts. And it really remains the last stumbling block uh, towards the renovation of Pennsylvania Avenue. So we're pleased the GSA is looking to move it. But we don't want it moved out of the city. Virginia and Maryland have offered up places, as Councilmember Orange mentioned, we have better places in every category for the FBI to relocate. They need, uh, I believe, 40 acres of land. They're going to combine their uh, field offices, which are numerous, and employees. And it needs to be in the district. And the two reasons Councilmember Orange mentioned, it brings a lot of people into the city, employees, and it brings a lot of tourists. And the places he mentioned, they are accessible to cars, metro stops. It is a number, a very big tourist attraction, and we need to keep it here, and we need to step up the effort. I haven't read a lot about the district doing anything. I have read a lot about Virginia and Maryland. Thank you. Co-sponsors, Councilmember Bonds, Councilmember Alexander, Councilmember Catania. Uh, this measure will be referred to the Committee of the Whole with comments from the Committee on Economic Development. Further, Mr. Orange? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman. Finally, I'm introducing today the Council Members Outside Employment Disclosure Act of 2013. Uh, this bill will require any member of the council who holds outside employment to file a report with the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability reporting the number of hours they work and the salary they are paid on a monthly basis. The board will have two weeks to upload the information on their website. Members who violate this provision will be subject to fines and penalties that are set by the board. The bill expands on the bill introduced on January 8th that would ban contractors who hire council members from receiving contracts from the district. The salaries that are paid to council members are sufficient full-time salaries, and therefore we should be also examining the amount of pay from outside employment. Since some members have outside employment that is that since some members have outside employment, it is imperative that they are more transparent to the public about their other employment. The public has a right to know how many hours these members devote to their jobs as a member of the council and to, and to their other job. Also, we need to ascertain whether or not these payments are gifts or they're actually being produced uh, uh, or provided for work that is actually being uh, conducted. It is time to be more open, honest, and accountable to our constituents as we move forward in addressing ethics, ethical issues in the government of the District of Columbia. Our ask for co-sponsors.
Uh, give me just a moment to look at the referral. Uh, are there co-sponsors for this? Councilmember Bowser. Councilmember Bonds. Uh, this uh, measure will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And co-sponsored by uh, Councilmember Catania. Thank you, Mr. Orange. Uh, Councilmember Berry for introductions. Mr. Chairman and members of the, of the Council, uh, I have three bills. The first is the Fiscal Year 2013 Budget Adjustment Act of 2013. I've sent various communications to all of you. The, base, base, the first question was, does the Council have the authority to it's been up to $100 million in that congressional review. Uh, General Counsel has an opinion that we do have that authority. So that should not be a question. The other question is one of priorities of our money. Since 06, 07, people's programs have got decimated. Affordable housing, uh, in terms of job training, we had the highest unemployment of any in the country almost. In terms of the university being supported, they just took a $14 million cut where over 100 people had to be laid off. And the homeless have, have taken the blunt of our past actions. And Jim Graham and I have worked awful hard to put homeless money together, about $8 million. Uh, we want to take families out of Virginia and Williams where they shouldn't be living. It's a horrific goal there to uh, put 50 families, need to be more. And then you have the whole question of, of summer jobs. Uh, summer jobs are not funded even at the level of six weeks. And um, that happens. And so I want to expand the senior meal program. And before I continue, though, Mr. Chairman, I'm delighted to have four other of my colleagues on this bill. Uh, the, the number one pusher is Jim Graham, who's been consistent uh, in that area. We have Kenya McDuffie, who had, may have some concerns about that list, but not about the direction uh, in terms of uh, Yvette Alexander, and myself, Nita Barnes, and Vincent Orange. And I've talked with the chairman about this bill. And I'm going to continue to press on it because these the money is what I propose, along with my co introducers, will go to what people. Now, let's deal with the uh, Wall Street question. I pass out among you a sheet indicating that even when the money was $900 million, or um, 1.2 or 3, we still had high bond ratings. And this proposal put all the $417 million into the bottom line of Wall Street for these Wall Street bankers and these rating organizations give us a, a, a good rating. And I can't walk down the streets of Anacostia and not explain to them that we don't need $417 million. Uh, we need 100 out of it. And I talked with the chairman. He's going to have hearings on it, but he's going to wait until after the revenue estimates is in. So, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate that. That's my main bill. I want to thank my co-introducers uh, for doing this because they recognize this is the right thing to do. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in terms of uh, my other bill, it's the uh, elderly abuse. Um, Mr. Fat, Barry, the eco fund. are you moving to your second bill? Because why don't we finish with the first I'm, one? I'm sorry, I, I forgot to ask for co-sponsors. All right, well, I'll ask for co-sponsors. Are there co-sponsors for the uh, Fiscal Year 2013 Budget Adjustment Act? All right, this bill will be referred to the Committee of the Whole. 
Mr. Berry for the second bill. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm pleased to, to introduce along with Councilman Barnes, Alexander, and Graham, the Charles and Hilda Mason Elderly Abuse Classification Expansion Act of 2013. This bill would amend criminal abuse and neglect uh, 2000 Adult Protection Service Act of 1984 and Title 21 of the District of Columbia Official Code to establish stricter penalties for elderly abuse or failure to report abuse or create more autonomy for elders, decrease criminal penalties for elderly abuse, uh, increase, establish financial abuse in a form of elderly abuse and prevention a convicted uh, clause from inheriting from their victims. Mr. Chairman, there are over 100,000 seniors in this city, uh, which is uh, one-sixth of our population. And we have instances where even in our own homes, the elderly are abused, either by family members or by caregivers. Uh, we, we pass an act that allows an ombudsman to go beyond just these homes, but into their individual homes. And people in, in the dawn of life, our young people, but people in the sunset years of their life, shouldn't be subject to this kind of abuse, shouldn't be subject to arbitrarily uh, people arming them without any recourse. This bill, Mr. Chairman, uh, will give our seniors another tool to report their abuse it also requires those who know of abuse, which means they could be caregivers, they could be family members, be mandatorily required to report, as we have done uh, in other cases in the city. And also, uh, it prevents a convicted abuser from inheriting from their victims, which means if it's a family member who may be in one's will when they probate it, they cannot get a penny because they have abused uh, their family member. And so uh, we have st other states dealing with this. The United States will bring our penalties for elder abuse and failure to report abuse to the same level as nearby jurisdictions, Maryland and Virginia. We're also establishing a financial abuse as a type of abuse in our code. Financial abuse is often uh, used to exploit our seniors by fortunately uh, signing checks for them or inheriting from an elder that someone has abused. Financial abuse is defined in Maryland Code, whether it's in California. And though a senior presence is required for every hearing regarding the guardianship or conservatorship, the chairman would often have now that guardianship or conservatorship at the probate level and does that. So the chairman would like to ask for co sponsors uh, for this very, very important bill of trying to decrease elderly abuse in the District of Columbia. We should get out to zero, but that's unrealistic, but we're going to get down a great deal. Thank Th you. Mr. Thank Chairman. you, Mr. Berry. Are there co-sponsors for this bill? Councilmember Bowser, Councilmember Orange, Councilmember Bonds. Co uh, yes, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, Councilmember McDuffie, Councilmember Catania, Councilmember Grasso. Uh, this measure will be referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Further, Mr. Berry? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Graham. May I note that Adult Protective Services is within the Committee of Human Services. And this involves the Committee of Human Services and the Department of Human Services. So I don't know why it would be an exclusive jurisdiction or referral to public safety. Uh, the reason uh, why I said judiciary and public safety is Section 2 uh, clearly involves a, uh, a criminal penalty. Right, but, but why should And that Section be 3 uh, concerns, among other things, fiduci fiduciary responsibilities, which is under the Committee on Judiciary. And Section... Uh, that was 3A, um, I believe, and uh, it also amends Title 22, which is the criminal code. Uh, comments, if you wish, comments from the Committee on Human Services. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Uh, I'm not discussing where you would put this bill, 
But this bill involves seniors, the elderly, uh, which is under preview of the committee that I chair, Mr. Graham is on. Uh, I don't see why we can't have comments from judiciary, and the main focus would be uh, in the, the senior citizens. We've done that before with various bills where the main part of the bill had been in one committee, but the uh, judicial part of it is referred to, as you very well know, comments from you. So I'd like for you to reconsider that and not request from Mr. Graham and myself, not make the decision now, uh, but to consider it and refer it to human services with comments from the judiciary. I will take it under advisement. So uh, the, the referral is under advisement. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Chairman. Next, Mr. Berry. Today I'm pleased to introduce the Public Education School Closure and Consolidation Reform Amendments of 2012. This bill requires council approval for the mayor or the chancellor to close or consolidate any public schools in the district and charter schools. This bill amends the Public Education Reform Act of 2007, requiring the mayor to submit a report to the council detailing the reasons for the closing and consolidation of a school and to submit a resolution for council approval. The council may also hold a public hearing on the resolution for approval or disapproval. Mr. Chairman, this bill provides for more checks and balances uh, for the mayor Chancellor and the Council. We know of the uproar that's been created uh, by the 20 schools that the Chancellor are uh, wanting to uh, recommend either closure or, for instance, in Ward 7, which had five schools on the chopping block. Uh, the Chancellor only uh, made amendments to give one. I think it's Smothers, Ms. Alexander. And so I really want to have major dialogue on it. Uh, I'm not uh, set with all the parts of the bill, but we need to have major dialogues about how we can better uh, close these schools. And I've talked to Mr. Chairman about this. There are more on the way uh, because of declining population. Uh, we were at Baloo uh, yesterday talking about uh, the education program, but also, as you know, Baloo has been put on for renovation. It's now going to probably cost about a hundred and $50 million, which I support fully. But they only have 800 students there. It's being built for 1,400, which means this bill will require the mayor and the chancellor to put alternative programs in Baloo, put programs to fill it up. And Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mr. Catania has some numbers about Woodson uh, not being, uh, and I support Woodson, Ms. Alexander does. There are other high schools, Ms. Bowser, in Ward 4, that are going to be saved temporarily, but unless we put programming in there, uh, you're not going to have that. The taxpayers are tired of spending money, uh, spending $200 uh, million dollars in Ward 7, spending money in Ward 8, and, and putting this money in, and then the school buildings are, are empty. Also, this bill will require that the mayor come up with a plan and a council as to what they do with these closed schools. We got some idea, but we don't have much of an idea. Let me make it very clear. I support Mayor Fenty uh, in terms of his mayority. I worked my, I worked out, worked out in what eight, eight to deliver votes. I support the chancellor. Uh, I called Holy Hell when we went out to hear hearings on the nomination, but I still supported her. So let it be known, this is not an anti-Mayor Gray bill, because I couldn't do that. We'll not do that. Not an anti-Chancellor Henderson bill, because I support that. And education is such a vital part of our Mr. Community. Barry, your time's expired. Okay, well, thank you. I ask for co-sponsors, Mr. Chairman. Are there co-sponsors for this? This is the Public Education School Closure and Consolidation Reform Amendment Act. Co-sponsors? Councilmember Alexander? This measure will be referred to the Committee on Education. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Mr. Catania for introductions. Uh, th thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Today I'm pleased to introduce, along with Council Members Che and Barry, the Testing Integrity Act of 2013. 
Mr. Chairman, statewide assessments are an indispensable method of measuring the academic progress of students. These assessments are, in fact, required under the federal, uh, federally mandated No Child Left Behind Act. Uh, given that so much is at stake with the outcomes of these assessments, it's imperative that they be administered in a way that ensures the integrity of the results. Each year, the district's comprehensive annual assessment, known as DCCAS, tests the proficiency of district students in grades 3 through 8 and the 10th grade in the subjects of reading, math, composition, science, and biology. In recent years, allegations of cheating on the district tests, in particular at Noyes Elementary School, have been investigated by the district's Office of State Superintendent of Education, the Inspector General, the U.S. Department of Education, and according to news reports, the U.S. Attorney for the District, district of Columbia. While none of these investigations has uncovered widespread cheating, at least some questions whether the district has appropriate protocols in place to ensure the security and integrity of its annual examinations is at issue. Parenthetically, Mr. Chairman, it's worth noting that the district is not alone when it comes to the issues of testing integrity. A recent article by the, Atlantic, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution identified nearly 200 school districts across the country that exhibited patterns of suspicious scores. Currently, there is no law in the district or a municipal regulation focused on testing integrity. Instead, the only guidelines that exist are those issued by the Office of the State Superintendent of Education and developed by our testing vendor, McGraw-Hill. Though so, some of these policies are quite appropriate, it is important that an anti-cheating system, which includes the recommendations of district investigators as well as best practices, be enshrined in district law. The Testing Integrity Act will make it a violation of district law to facilitate in any way cheating on statewide assessment tests. The legislation requires public schools and public charter schools, among other things, to develop and submit to OSSI a testing security plan that describes the procedures used for storing test materials in a secure location, monitoring test administration in individual schools, and a description of the plan used in training personnel and test security. DCPS and our public charter schools will be required to identify a system-wide test integrity coordinator as well as test, testing integrity monitors at each school. The legislation identifies impermissible behaviors and actions or those that could constitute cheating as an alternative test at, such as uh, altering test documents or allowing students to preview test items among other things. Finally, the legislation I'm introducing establishes a requirement uh, to so of signed affidavits for specified individuals responsible for administering assessments uh, in schools, as well as a procedure for instituting sanctions for violations of testing security that range from restrictions on a teacher's certification to cancellation of a teacher's certification to teach in the district. Mr. Chairman, few states currently have statewide laws focused on testing integrity. Indeed, if enacted, the Testing Integrity Act will place the district at the forefront of jurisdictions to ensure the integrity of our student assessments. District parents deserve a testing system where cheating does not occur, and more importantly, a system where cheating cannot occur. And our educators deserve to have student gains beyond dispute and reproach. Mr. Chairman, at the end of the day, this legislation, uh, this legislation creates a framework under which the Office of the State Superintendent of Education will establish, monitor, enforce the highest standards of testing integrity, something that is long overdue. I welcome co-sponsors, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Catania. Are there co-sponsors? Councilmember Orange, Councilmember Bowser, Councilmember Evans, Councilmember Bonds, Councilmember Wells, Councilmember Alexander, Councilmember Grasso, Councilmember McDuffie. This measure will be referred to the Committee on Education. Further? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Today I'm pleased to introduce the Belmont Park Designation and Establishment Act of 2013, along with Council Members Che and Evans. Uh, this legislation designates a, the public right-of-way west of Connecticut Avenue Northwest at the Belmont Road and Connecticut Avenue intersection as a public park and transfers responsibilities for this area from the District's Department of Transportation to the Department of Parks and Recreation. Uh, this transfer will place the property in the District's portfolio of public parks. Uh, Mr. Chairman, for years, district residents have used this right-of-way at the corner of Belmont and Connecticut Avenue Northwest, which was uh, never opened as a public road, as a place they gather, take scenic walks, and otherwise simply enjoy the beauty of the area. It is, in practice, Mr. Chairman, a park. However, considering that the area is not ma maintained by, currently by the Department of Parks and Recreation, it does not receive the maintenance and upkeep necessary to make the area safe and enjoyable for the community, uh, as it might be if it were officially designated as a park. 
It is my hope that by transferring responsibility for Belmont Park to the Department of Parks and Recreation, that fallen tree branches, garbage, wild grass, and other debris will be removed and that the facilities will be maintained, or the, the park will be maintained. Uh, the district has many urban parks, uh, Mr. Chairman, that make the, the place a busy, the, the city a, a special place uh, for our residents. Uh, the community surrounding this area has clearly expressed a desire that this property be added to the district's roster of public parks, and I would urge my colleagues to support them in this effort. Uh, I would welcome co-sponsorship, and Mr. Chairman, uh, if uh, either of my co-introducers or co-authors would have a statement, I would welcome that at this time. Nothing in here. Co-sponsors, Councilmember Bowser. Councilmember Wells, Councilmember Grasso, Councilmember Che, did you want to say anything? Yes, I guess I didn't get your attention soon enough. I simply wanted to thank uh, Councilmember Catania uh, for bringing this forward because uh, we have to have a, a testing system that we can rely on and that... This is on parks. Uh, oh, on the park. I'm sorry. Well, and we should have a park that has a good testing system <laughs> that... Uh, never mind. <laughs> I lost track of. Thank you, Councilmember Che. So many bills, so little time. <laughs> Thank you, Councilmember Che. Uh, are there any further co-sponsors? Uh, this measure will be referred to the Committee of the Whole. Further, Mr. Catania? <laughs> Councilmember Che for introductions. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have three items uh, for today. Uh, first, I'm introducing the Nurse Safe Staffing Act of 2013, assuring excellent uh, care and the safety of every hospital patient in the district are, is a top priority. And toward that end, everyone agrees that the people of the district are entitled to having the full benefit of skilled, attentive, and well-trained nurses in every hospital. The question is, uh, how do we ensure this? Earlier today, we had a proposal that was offered whose core provision is mandatory staffing ratios um, uh, for every hospital. And as, as the heart of, of that proposal, um, this is offered as an alternative. For patients seeking improved care, an inflexible wooden one-size-fits-all approach isn't the answer. In fact, it may degrade it. And just two points. Currently, the district uh, hospitals with uh, all of the uh, people who uh, operate there on behalf of our patients operate basically as teams who provide care for patients. Registered nurses provide critical care while ancillary staff ensure that patients receive uh, non-clinical uh, services such as, you know, attending to bedpans and things of that nature. Costs of increasing a hospital's nursing staff may lead to a reduction or a decline in the ancillary staff, which will require nurses to take on additional non-nurse related uh, responsibilities. This is what has been happening in the only state, California, that has adopted this one-size-fits-all mandatory staffing ratios. Moreover, mandatory staffing ratios also require uh, these mandated numbers of nurses despite the fact that each district hospital provides specialized care and the patients at these facilities have different needs. The legislation uh, I'm proposing today would provide a flexible and more tailored and more precise answer to the problem of patient safety by allowing hospitals and the nurses in those hospitals to work together to improve patient care through the creation of staffing plans. Specifically, the bill would require each hospital in the district to develop and implement a hospital-wide staffing plan for nursing services. The plan would be developed by hospital nurses uh, and a staffing committee, which will be comprised of at least 55% of non-management registered nurses in the hospital. Require that the staffing numbers be based upon patient numbers and the variable intensity of care needed. Require the staffing committee to take into account the level of education, training, and experience of the RNs providing care. Ensuring that RNs are not forced to work in units where they're not trained or experienced. Hold hospitals accountable by imposing civil monetary penalties for each knowing uh, violation. And it, too, has many provisions like the one we heard earlier, such as whistleblower protections. This bill that I'm offering was drafted and endorsed by the American Nurses Association, which is the national professional organization for nurses. I offer this bill so that the Health Committee will have another model, other than the bill already introduced today, 
a model that makes more sense and will actually improve safety and care of patients. I invite co-sponsors. Are there co-sponsors for this bill? Councilmember Catania. Councilmember Evans. Uh, this measure will be referred to the Committee on Health. Further, Councilmember Che. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today, I'm uh, also introducing the False Claims Amendment Act of 2013. Under current district law, the False Claims Act does not apply to violations of the tax code. This means that the district cannot obtain information from whistleblowers that may be relevant to the investigation and prosecution of tax evaders. This bill would make a necessary change to the district's False Claims Act. It would allow the district to use the tools of the False Claims Act against the district's biggest tax evaders in a manner already authorized for other applications of the act. Under the bill, whistleblowers would be eligible to receive a reward for providing information that helps the district collect money that it is owed. As with all other applications of the False Claims Act, the whistleblower, um, this whistleblower bill uh, would make uh, those who provide information eligible for a reward if certain conditions are met. The district would have to recover money from the tax evader. The recovery must have been based in part on information supplied by the whistleblower. And the supplied information must have uh, been non-public information that the government did not already have. Thus, people with information that could actually help the government would have an incentive to come forward, but those with just some sort of a hunch or a grudge or something like that would not. Further, this bill would not significantly increase litigation. It would only authorize whistleblowers and, and the government to bring tax-related claims under the False Claims Act when the claims are worth $350,000 or more and are brought against persons or entities that have an income above $1 million. So far, the federal government and New York have updated their whistleblower laws to include tax-related claims. The federal program created in 2006 has already been a success. Based on the claims of a whistleblower, the IRS recovered a $780 million settlement from a major company. The whistleblower received $104 million. Further, this case ultimately led to 14,000 delinquent taxpayers coming forward, allowing the IRS to recover more than $5 billion in previously unpaid taxes. In another case, a whistleblower received $38 million as part of a recovery against a top 500 firm. On the state level, New York updated its False Claims Act in 2010. Since then, one tax-related case has been brought under the Act, a case that is pending, and if the state of New York is successful in that case, it could recover more than $300 million in unpaid taxes. The district should follow the lead of New York and the federal government and allow the district's False Claims Act to apply to tax-related claims against these high-income uh, uh, tax entities. This will allow the district to recover uh, needed revenue that is already owed to it, and I would invite co-sponsors. Co-sponsors, Councilmember Bonds. Um, this measure will be referred sequentially, first to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety, and then to the Committee as a whole. Further, Councilmember Che? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today I'm also introducing the Sense of the Council Clean Air Cities Resolution of 2013. By passing this resolution, the district will join with cities across the country in urging the President and the Environmental Protection Agency to move as swiftly as possible to mitigate carbon pollution, which is causing climate change. Other cities uh, that have already passed similar resolutions include Los Angeles, Chicago, Cincinnati, Milwaukee, Seattle, Pittsburgh, Nashville, Philadelphia, Miami, Detroit, Salt Lake City, and Kansas City. Climate change is already affecting our planet as we know. As the resolution explains in great detail, the last decade was the warmest on record. Deadly weather events like superstorm Sandy are devastating uh, regions of the country with frequency, and sea levels are rising faster than many scientists projected. The dangers of unchecked climate change will only grow. In order to ensure clean air and a healthy climate, we must reduce greenhouse gas pollution. On the national level, the Clean Air Act is one tool available to reach this goal in the United States. The United uh, States Supreme Court has already ruled that the Clean Air Act is applicable to greenhouse gas pollution, and the Environmental Protection Agency has already begun to use this important tool to reduce greenhouse gas pollution. But the act is often under attack from the fossil fuel industry. Cities across the country can be a powerful voice for prompting uh, federal action. 
to counter opposition to the Clean Air Act and its application and to further educate about the urgency of the climate crisis and the tool we have in the Clean Air Act to slow carbon pollution now, cities across the country have joined Clean Air Cities, a national campaign urging cities around the United States to call on President Obama and the Environmental Protection Agency to vigorously use the Clean Air Act to make significant reductions in greenhouse gas pollution. These resolutions have been forwarded to the EPA and to the Obama administration. And today, with this resolution, I would like the district to join them, and I invite uh, co-sponsors. Are there co-sponsors? Councilmember Pons. Councilmember Alexander. I'll list myself as a co-sponsor. Uh, this measure will be retained by the council. Thank you, Councilmember Che. Councilmember Graham for introductions. Thank you very much. I have three bills. Um, first, uh, I'd like to co-introduce with Councilmember Barry the Rent Control Hardship Petition Limitation Act of 2013. Let me explain why this bill is important. In a case where a landlord has filed a hardship petition and the rent administrator has failed to <clears throat> excuse me, issue a decision within the required 90 days, this bill would limit the amount of the conditional rent increase for any affected unit up to only 5% of the rent charged. But under the current law, landlords are permitted to file what is known as a hardship petition to seek approval to earn up to 12% rate of return on their property investment. If he or she is not earning that rate of return, that petition may be filed. Now, the rent administrator is supposed to issue an order granting or denying the hardship petition within 90 days. However, what actually happens is that very often the rent administrator fails to rule on the petition within 90 days, and at the occurrence of the 90 days, the landlord may then take a conditional rent increase in accordance with the request in the petition. So if the landlord has asked for 10%, after 90 days, he simply imposes 10% on his tenants. This can occur until the, and the increase continues until the rent administrator issues his or her final ruling. When petitions languish before the rent administrator as they have at various times over the years for a variety of reasons, conditional rent increases can drive tenants out of their apartments. Even if it is found that a petition has languished for an excessive amount of time, a displaced, a displaced tenant may longer, no longer be able to return to their apartment. Thus, they have essentially been evicted. No one experiences difficult economic times more than our low-income residents. And this discussion is not about rate of return or profit margin, but about facing eviction and possible homelessness. The bill would limit any increase on a temporary basis to 5% to or less, and it strengthens important tenant protections that are contained in rent control and that ensures that our tenants are not vulnerable to the inaction of the city official, the rent administrator. Council Member Barry may wish to make an additional comment. Mr. Chairman, I support that. I was glad to be a caution just on this bill. Uh, we have to use every, every means necessary to protect our tenants. Uh, we have another problem, Mr. Graham, which is not in this committee, in our committee. That is, these condo fees. There's another problem that's something I'm working on to try to bring some consistency even in that area. People who buy condos start at one level of fees, it, it can double without anything except it happens. So I support this, Mr. Chairman, and I wish other, other council members support this very important piece of legislation. Thank you, Mr. Berry. Uh, Co-sponsors, Councilmember Evans, Councilmember Che, Councilmember Bonds, Councilmember Alexander, Councilmember Grasso, Councilmember McDuffie, Chairman Mendelson. This bill will be referred to the Committee on Economic Development. Further, Mr. Graham. Chairman, I'm now introducing a bill which is intended to address what is in many neighborhoods a huge nuisance, and that is a car alarm that goes off hour after hour after hour, day after day, sometimes weeks, without being attended. And the, my first experience with this was back in 2004, and at that time I amended what was called the Georgetown Project and Noise Control Amendment Act 
to make it illegal for a person to install, operate, or use any vehicle theft alarm system that issues a sound that is not or does not become automatically and completely silenced within five minutes. In other words, if there was a car alarm that went off for more than five minutes, it's not illegal. It's, it's illegal in the District of Columbia. However, what we have found is that this has not been enforceable by MPD. And so as recently as just a couple of weeks ago, there was still another one of these incessant car alarms. It happened to be in Mount Pleasant. And MPD advised us that there was nothing they could do. So this, this bill is intended to provide a remedy for this nuisance. And what it would simply do is that having a car alarm go off continuously for 24 hours would give authority to MPD to have the car, and DPW, to have the car towed. So it can continue to make its noise, but it's just going to make that noise in an impoundment lot. So there's no issue of breaking, quote, breaking into the car or, or finagling the car's devices. The car would just simply be pulled out of the neighborhood. And let me tell you that there would be terrific support for this in any neighborhood that has experienced these car alarms. And you know how they're set off. They're set off by another car touching the car. And that, that sets off the alarm. Sometimes the person is out of town. Sometimes they don't care. Sometimes they're parked four blocks away. Who knows? But this would give MPD the authority it needs to silence the alarms by moving the car. And, and I think that this bill makes a lot of sense, and I hope that people will support it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Are there co-sponsors for this legislation? Councilmember Bowser. Councilmember Barry. Councilmember Evans. This bill will be referred to the Committee on Transportation and Environment. Further, Mr. Graham? Where would you refer it? Transportation and the Environment. I think you get this one, too. Mr. Chairman, I'm now introducing the Endangered Species Protection Act of 2013. Currently, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service is the principal federal agency responsible for implementing and enforcing the United States Endangered Species Act. The federal agency regulates the import and export, as well as the interstate and foreign commerce, of any endangered or threatened wildlife, including parts or products from those species. However, over 30 jurisdictions have enacted laws that explicitly ban the sale or intent to sell products made from endangered species within their jurisdiction. The District of Columbia is not one of those jurisdictions. This bill would protect endangered species by making it illegal in the District of Columbia to transport, possess for resale, or sell any hides, skins, or other parts thereof, or any article made in whole or in part from any species of wildlife designated as an endangered species under federal law. The provision mirrors that of 30 other states. I understand that the diversity of our city invites individuals from all over the world who bring with them relics and articles that may not be banned in their country of origin. Furthermore, many of our residents have traveled to foreign countries and bring back objects that are not legally saleable within the United States. Nonetheless, it is important that this council pass a law that ensures such items, which are validly purchased outside the United States, will not be sold in the District of Columbia, and we would join the majority of states. Let me just mention that I was recently at one of our local auction houses where there was an ocelot pelt, which was for sale. And I said to the owners of the auction house, I said, you're selling an ocelot? You know, I'm sure ocelots, you know, this beautiful animal that runs so gracefully, in Africa and elsewhere. Surely that ocelots are protected under the Endangered Species Act. And the person said to me, well, they may be protected under the Endangered Species Act, but they're not protected in the District of Columbia. And so that was enough of a notice for me to say, we've got to protect the pelts and other animal parts of animals that are protected under federal law. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Are there co-sponsors for this legislation? Councilmember Che. Councilmember Evans, Councilmember Bonds, Councilmember Grasso. This measure will be referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. And DDOE has an environmental justice office to enforce just this sort of thing. So uh, this bill deals with establishing a criminal penalty. And it also does not deal with um, animals.
for the most part, that are living in the District of Columbia. Uh, so it would deal with, for instance, uh, ivory or pelts. And so uh, I view it as a criminal statute. If you wish, I'll take it under advisement. Well, I, I would appreciate that because uh, the Department of the Environment has a, a section that uh, uh, enforces just these kinds of laws, investigates and enforces. Um, I will, I'll take it under advisement. Um, and perhaps you could work with general counsel to uh, explain that a little further. Uh, Mr. Graham, I think those are your three bills. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember McDuffie for introductions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Today I'm introducing the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability Amendment Act of 2013. The bill has two components. Uh, number one, it clarifies that the Ethics Board may issue advisory opinions on its own initiative. And number two, it expands the range of penalties available to the Ethics Board to address violations of the Code of Official Conduct. With respect to the former, under current law, it is unclear that the authority of the Ethics Board to issue advisory opinions extends beyond the circumstance in which an employee or public official requests such an opinion from the Board. However, it would certainly be in the public interest to allow the Ethics Board to proactively issue advisory opinions on any matter that it deems sufficient of public importance. Therefore, this bill makes explicit that the Ethics Board may issue advisory opinions upon its own initiative. The bill also addresses the Ethics Board's need for greater flexibility in the range of penalties that it may impose for a violation of the Code of Official Conduct. In addition to civil penalties and remedial action in accordance with the Merit Personnel Act already contemplated by the title, the bill would allow the Ethics Board to assess the following additional penalties. A public censure, a non-public informal admonition, a period of probation and a negotiated disposition. A broader range to penalties will allow the board to dispose of some of the more de minimis violations of the code, such as a one-time minor misuse of government property. It would also provide the board with the necessary tools to secure cooperating witnesses in an investigation, giving it the flexibility and the leverage it needs to carry out its important mission. At this point, I would invite co-sponsorship of this measure. Other co-sponsors for this legislation? Councilmember Catania, Councilmember Wells, Councilmember Grasso. Uh, this measure will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Further, Mr. McDuffie? Yes, Mr. Chair. Today I'm also introducing the Prohibition on Government Employee Political uh, Engagement in Political Activity Amendment Act of 2013. This legislation is intended to update and harmonize the district's local Hatch Act with the recent changes to the Federal Hatch Act. On December 28, 2012, the Federal Hatch Act Modernization Act of 2012 was enacted. The Modernization Act removed the district government from the coverage from coverage under the Federal Hatch Act, which affects the political rights of government employees. Moreover, the Federal Modernization Act also loosened its restrictions on, for example, federal employees who wish to participate in local partisan elections. Additionally, the Federal Modernization Act also increased the range of penalties available to be meted out for violation of the act, moving away from a stringent standard of termination for violations of the act, and give it the Merit Systems Protection Board more flexibility in fashioning penalties that match the severity of the violation. To illustrate the problem, now that the Modernization Act has been enacted, a district resident who works for the federal government can now fully participate in a local partisan election. But a district resident who is a district government employee cannot fully participate in a federal election. I should also note that currently our Hatch Act laws are the most restrictive in the region. For example, Virginia and Maryland largely allow their state employees to participate in political activity, and there's no prohibition on employees participating in federal campaigns in either state. Also, a Virginia or Maryland government employee could fully participate in a district ele election, but the district government employee cannot fully participate in a Maryland or Virginia partisan election. That type of counterintuitive restriction is what this legislation aims to correct. Thanks in large part to our general counsel, we have identified several simple changes that can be made to our local Hatch Act to harmonize our laws with the new federal restrictions. The legislation would, add definitions, clarify that the Board of Ethics and Government Accountability shall enforce its provisions, address non-district elections, and provide enforcement of the Act through the Code of Conduct. These common sense changes to the district's restrictions will clarify the law so that district employees can actually understand what is prohibited. Additionally, the legislation would be retroactive to January 28, 2012 to ensure continuity with the recent changes in the Federal Hatch Act. With that, I would ask my colleagues for any co-sponsorship. Are there co-sponsors for this legislation? Councilmember Alexander, Councilmember Grasso, Councilmember Wells, Councilmember Che, Councilmember Bowser, 
Councilmember Bonds. This measure will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Further, Mr. McDuffie? Not the problem, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. McDuffie. Councilmember Wells for introduction. Mr. Chairman, um, I'm sorry, I, I missed the, uh, it, Jim Graham is really distracting me today, but I, I missed the, uh, the. No, he gets a point of personal privilege yes, the, for the, five the, minutes. The, Council Member uh, McDuffie, I wanted to be a co-sponsor on his uh, uh, government Board of Ethics and Government Accountability Establishment and Comprehensive Ethics Reform Amendment Act, I think. <laughs> Uh, in other words, because I think you just co-sponsored the last one, so you want to be a co-sponsor on both of Mr. McDuffie's yes, bills. please. All right. Thank you. Stop Mr. Wells for introductions. Yes, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Today, along with my colleagues, Councilmember Che, Councilmember Catania, Councilmembers Evans, Graham, and Barry, I'm introducing the Marriage Efficient please. Amendment Act of 2013. This bill, which is modeled after successful laws in Massachusetts and Vermont, would establish a mechanism by which the Superior Court of the District of Columbia can establish the authority of a temporary officiant to perform marriage ceremonies. You may recall that a similar bill was introduced by two previous council periods. Those proposals had a very similar goal in mind, but used the mechanism of a notary public to be the officiant. This bill would instead authorize an individual chosen by the couple to perform that role with the authority limited to a single day and that single marriage. I'd like to yield the, my remaining time to my co-introducers. Through you, Mr. Chair, I'd like to yield first to Councilmember Che, who's been a strong advocate for change in this area. I'd like to speak. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Wells. Um, as the author of the Marriage Efficient Act of 2010 and the Marriage Efficient Act of 2011, I'm pleased uh, to join you today in reintroducing this important legislation, which actually has uh, improvements. Um, Currently, only two groups of people can officiate a marriage ceremony in the district, a religious official or a judge or court clerk. That means in order to be legally married in the district, you either have to go to a minister or to a court. And there are some district residents who would like to be married but have no religious affiliation and would pre prefer to be married outside of the courthouse. Many states have expanded the set of people who can officiate marriages and found that this has not caused any problems and has given people an opportunity to have their marriage performed by by others than the court and a religious entity. And this uh, bill is an important step in support of equal rights for all residents. And again, I thank Councilmember Wells for his leadership on the issue, and I hope we can have a hearing and move this forward swiftly. Thank you. Uh, further in a minute left by co-introducers. Co I'd like to speak to Evans. Yes, no, I'm very pleased to uh, have this legislation uh, because I've actually uh, performed a marriage ceremony. I don't know if anybody else in the diocese has ever done that. But um, if you, you, the way to go, it was invalid, huh? Okay. Chairman, can I comment? No, if you can actually, if you have a judge in the room with you, your time. Uh, sitting in the back who signs the papers, you can actually do that. But it causes, it's a lot of effort to do that. So this, uh, I think, uh, eliminates that uh, necessity of uh, doing that. And it, it really is uh, an opportunity. I, I, I don't know if others have had, uh, many people have asked me to perform these ceremonies. And uh, in the past, it's just been uh, uh, hard to do because you have to get a judge to actually come to the ceremony. So uh, I think this is a real step in the direction of uh, enabling individuals who want to have uh, someone to perform the ceremony who is not a uh, member of the, uh, of the bar or a religious person. So I'm pleased to move forward with this. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I have a few few seconds? Uh, well, the three minutes are expired. If there's no objection, you, you give me a couple of seconds, yes. Um, Chairman, I uh, want to enthusiastically join in the, in the uh, introducing and even supporter of this amendment. Uh, for some time, the members of the council wanted to perform these duties, couldn't do it. And so I wholeheartedly support it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Are there co-sponsors? And Mr. Chair, let me also add that I believe that Mr. Grasso is a co-introducer of this bill, and I don't see, and so he needs to be added as a co-introducer. Uh, well, he'll Thank you, to, Mr. Chair. He'll have to talk to uh, Councilmember um, Wells. Councilmember Wells, yes. <laughs> so recirculate. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, let's see, I was asking for co-sponsors. Are there co-sponsors on this bill? This measure will be referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Further, Mr. Wells? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Today I'm, I'm introducing with Council Members Grasso, Che, and Graham 
the, introducing the Coal-Fired Prohibition Act of 2013. This bill would ban the use of coal as a, use, as a fuel source for power generation in the District of Columbia. The action is necessary to protect district residents from harmful emissions resulting from coal burning in the heart of an urban residential neighborhood. As some of you will recall, in 2009 with Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid and then Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi committed to end harm the harmful practice of coal burning at the Capitol Power Plant, a steam generation plant located immediately next door to neighborhood homes, playgrounds, and schools. Some of you may also recall that the architect of the Capitol the operator of this power plant, promising to transition to natural gas and other less harmful forms of energy. In March 2009, nearly four years ago, the architect of the Capitol wrote to then Speaker Pelosi that they are developing a strategy for equipping the U.S. Capitol power plant to meet steam demands without using coal. Like many, I was surprised to learn that this plant continues to burn coal, sending fine particulate matter, nitrogen oxides, hydrochloric acid, and other harmful harmful pollutants into the neighborhood. It's not uncommon for the residents around the power plant to f find a fine layer of soot and ash on their property from the remains of burning coal, fine particulates that create significant health hazards to children in the area. In fact, an, an estimated 11.8 percent of D.C. children suffer from asthma, compared with 8.8 percent of children nationally. And a recent RAND health analysis reveals that asthma rates among children in some of the D.C. neighborhoods are over 15 percent. I will continue working with our community leaders, the District Department of the Environment, congressional leaders, the architects of the Capitol, and anyone else necessary to achieve the goals of this legislation. Welcome comments from any of the other co-introducers. Other co-sponsors. Uh, I welcome comments from any co-introducers, co Mr. Nobody, Chair. Nobody spoke up. I'm asking for co-sponsors. No, 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 okay. Thank you. Um, it should be, though. List, uh, list me as a co-sponsor. Uh, this chairman, Mr. Berry. Uh, as a co-introducer. Uh, you're not uh, listed as a co-introducer. Uh, very important piece of legislation. And I want to commend Councilmember Wells <laughs> for taking leadership on this because this power plant is in his ward, but also it affects the citizens outside of that ward. Anybody who parks over there uh, will be getting this ash. And since I'm a scientist, I better understand it than most. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. And for the official record, um, Mr. Berry is a co-introducer, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. If that's okay with the chief uh, sponsor, chief introducer of the bill. Absolutely. You, you'll have to recirculate it with the signatures. Mr. Right, this bill will be okay. referred to the Committee on Government Operations with comments from the Committee on Transportation and the Environment. Uh, Mr. Wells, is that your three bills? No, there were two bills, but that's all I have today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. That's what I said. Are those your two bills? Um, Mr. Grasso, for introductions. Thank you, Chairman. Today I'm pleased to introduce, along with Councilmember Kenyon McDuffie, the Public Financing of P Political Campaigns Act of 2013. The intent of this bill is to seek to hear all the voices in our democracy, to level the playing field for candidates, and to return the attention of lawmakers to the work at hand, as opposed to the riding a treadmill of fundraising activity in order to survive in public service. I'm asking that the D.C. Council step up, like Maine, Connecticut, Arizona, and North Carolina, and pass a law that embraces citizens-funded elections. Support for candidates in the District of Columbia generally comes from three sources. Friends of a candidate who know her qualifications and support her aspirations for democracy and the common good. Citizens who have views on governance and public policy or citizens with grievances with governance. And individuals with commercial interests that either benefit or risk loss due to decisions of governance. All of these sources are appropriate in, functioning, in a functioning democracy. The situation we face today is that we are out of balance. Forces with something to gain from political influence by far outweigh all other citizens and interests. We cannot return the balance by simply punishing one source or another. The appropriate solution is to return to the balance that has served our democracy over many generations and increases the number of engaged residents who have a stake in their leaders. My public financing of a political campaigns act helps restore that balance. The following are some of the key features. 
Candidates qualify for public financing by collecting seed money contributions of up to $100 per person. Qualified candidates receive grant funding from the government in primary and then in general elections to appropriately convey their electoral message. Public debates will be convened at appropriate times for all voting audiences to enhance the civic discussion of public issues and office holder responsibilities. Administration and oversight of the program will ensure fairness, success in message delivery, and address concerns of citizens and financial supporters. This legislation provides for financing these election costs through assessing a small fee on all government contracts that are over $1 million a year. Our fledgling democracy in the District of Columbia depends largely on campaign donations from special interests who need government influence for commercial reasons. As a government, we are overdue to build interest and activism from citizens who have a stake in our city's future. A focus on smaller dollar donations with a matching public grant to pay for elections will enlarge the voices of everyday D.C. residents. Thank you for considering this legislation. I hope that all of my colleagues will stand up for publicly funded elections and co-sponsor this legislation. And I'd like to yield the remainder of my time to uh, my co-introducer, Councilmember McDuffie. Mr. McDuffie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Councilmember Grasso, uh, for your leadership around this issue. Uh, public financing is a very important issue. It's not a novel issue. Obviously, it's done uh, on the federal side. It's done in other jurisdictions, including New York and San Francisco. And so uh, given the priority uh, of uh, campaign finance reform in this city, uh, I look forward to, along with my colleagues on the Committee on Government Operations, of handling hearings. I really invite the public's input uh, on this, as it will uh, fundamentally, I think, change the landscape of how we finance campaigns. And so I'm excited about it and look forward to a, a hearty public debate on the issue. Thank you, Mr. McDuffie. Mr. Grasso, uh, co-sponsors of this legislation, Mr. Graham, Councilmember Che, <laughs> Councilmember Bonds, Councilmember Catania, <laughs> Chairman Mendelson, this bill will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. I would, I'd like to be a co-sponsor, Chairman Mendelson. Councilmember Wells as a yeah. co-sponsor. Councilmember Barry as a co-sponsor. <laughs> Further, Mr. Grasso? No, that's all I have. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Bowser for introductions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, today I'm introducing uh, with my colleague, uh, Councilmember McDuffie, the Special Purpose Revenue Fund for Special Elections. Um, in April 2011, as you know, Mr. Chairman, we held a special election um, to fill the seat uh, vacated by Kwame Brown, the at-large council seat. About a year later, in 2012, uh, we conducted another special election to fill the Ward 5 council seat. Um, and this year, uh, we will conduct yet another special election to, to fill um, your at-large council seat, Mr. Mendelson. So in one year and a half, um, our Board of Elections has conducted three special elections. Um, historically, special elections have occurred at a rate not so frequent not so frequent, but by no means um, is it uncommon for us to have special elections. I did a quick count, um, and of the member, just of the current members of the council, at least I think um, eight of us um, were elected in a special election. And since 1994, there have been 11 special elections, about one every other year. Um, so not all of these uh, elections have been unforeseen, um, and we were better able to budget for them. Uh, and as was the case uh, last year, the funds to fund the special election in War 5 did not uh, become available until right before the election, which caused a lot of angst for the Board of Elections, um, um, there were angst among the candidates and certainly the residents of Ward 5. Um, so we need a, to do a better job at planning um, and funding uh, these special elections. So what this bill would do was create a, uh, a special election fund. Um, it's simply for the purpose of placing unspent annual appropriations into um, this fund uh, so that we can uh, begin to be better prepared for special elections should they be necessary. Um, so with that, I would like to invite uh, Mr. McDuffie, who I introduced this with, to make any comments and, of course, invite all the members of the council to co-sponsor it. Um, co uh, Mr. McDuffie. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Councilmember Bowser, for introducing this important measure. Uh, as you uh, uh, articulated, this is a, important to make sure that the Board of Elections and the city is prepared uh, in the event that we have special elections. 
uh, a number of us sit here on the day of the day as a result of winning special elections. And, and as we look towards uh, April of this year when we're going to have another special election, it's important to make sure we have uh, uh, funding to adequately allow uh, BOE to do its job. So again, I thank you for uh, introducing this measure. Thank you, Mr. McDuffie. Uh, Co-sponsors for this legislation? Councilmember Che. Councilmember Alexander. This bill will be, will, Councilmember, Councilmember Barry. Thank you. Uh, this bill will be referred to the Committee on Government Operations. Further, Councilmember Bowser. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, today I'm introducing the Video Visitation Modification Act of 2013, along with Councilmember Barry, Councilmember Jim Graham, and Councilmember Evans. Last July, the D.C. Department of Corrections instituted a change in visitation at the D.C. jail, which barred in-person visitation and instituted a video visitation only policy. The Department of Corrections action meant that the detainees only option to visit with their family members was via a video screen with the visitor seated at the DC jails video visitation center the justification for the video only um, visitation is that it saved some money but the harm done cannot be measured in dollars and cents the Department of Corrections decision to eliminate in-person visits deprives detainees and their families of meaningful visitation in favor of the impersonal virtual visit Visitation, a poor substitute for many families. And there are significant benefits, we believe, to in-person visitation, uh, which the department uh, does not pay enough deference to. In-person visits provide the obvious benefit of strengthening family ties and times that can threaten those bonds, and they do much to, prefer to preserve the inmates' morale. Studies have shown that strengthening family ties assist in detainee rehabilitation and reintegration uh, to society. Uh, we know uh, that there's a lot we must do to reintegrate our returning citizens into our communities so that they can be productive members of their families um, and of their neighborhoods. There's much that we have to do um, and I believe that this is one um, important step. So for these reasons I'm introducing the video vis visitation uh, Modification Act of 2013, along with Council Member Barry, who had a measure before the Council um, in the last session that also addressed this issue, um, and with Mr. Graham and Mr. Evans. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to invite uh, and uh, I would like to invite Mr. Uh, Barry or the co-introducers to comment. In the 50 seconds remaining. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barry. Uh, I enthusiastically support uh, this. Uh, version of the bill. Uh, as you know, I introduced uh, an, a video visits only. Uh, we, these, first of all, Mr. Chairman, in terms of D.C. jail, 50% uh, of those who are arrested uh, end up not being charged. And so, therefore, you're depriving at least 50% of the people of uh, the opportunity. But I'm going to tell you, Mr. Chairman, it's a lonely feeling not to be able to talk to your loved ones, to your friends, et cetera. And so, Mrs. Bowser, I welcome this option, and I hope we can get hearings right away, uh, Mr. 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 Well, and get it done because it's uh, not very good public policy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Are there co-sponsors for this legislation? Councilmember Orange, Councilmember Che, Councilmember Bonds, Councilmember Wells. Uh, this bill will be referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Further, Councilmember Bowser? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Alexander for introductions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'm introducing the cardiopulmonary resuscitation and automatic external defibrillator, which I'll refer to as AED. Uh, Requirements Amendment Act of 2013. I'm pleased to be joined by Council Members Graham, Evans, and Barry as co-introducers. Uh, every year as many as 450,000 people in the U.S. die from sudden cardiac arrest, and between seven to 10,000 of them are children. The key to their survival is quick and proper treatment. Survival is literally a matter of seconds. 
all 50 states have enacted laws or regulations requiring AEDs in public places. Some, like Maryland, have directly addressed the need for AEDs in our schools. Currently, the D.C. law requires any expected AED user to receive training or certification and CPR and AED use and maintain their certification. An AED program has also been mandated by law for our parks and recreation facilities. The bill that I'm introducing today would require the mayor to develop and implement a CPR and AED program for the District of Columbia ele <clears throat> elementary and secondary schools. Um, this program must provide procedures for responding to a medical em emergency involving cardiac arrest, including the appropriate use of CPR and an AED. And in addition, it will ensure that at least one AED is provided on site at district schools, at least one AED is readily available at athletic activities at the District of Columbia schools. Each AED is maintained, operated, and tested according to the manufacturer's guidelines by conducting periodic inspections and annual maintenance of each AED. And each AED at a district school is appropriate to use on children and adults. It will also require each coach, coaching assistant, school nurse, athletic trainer, and or team game physician um, an expected and an expected AED user employed by the District of Columbia Public Schools have successfully completed a training program or C and CPR training and the operation and use of the AED. A trained individual will be present during school's hours of operation and during any athletic activity. Some schools are notified as school employees, I'm sorry, are notified as to the location of all AEDs at their school and documents of training and AED maintenance are kept. This bill represents another way we can keep our children safe while they are active um, and I, well, I don't have any time to yield to my co-introducers, but thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman, I'd like to ask you to give me a couple of seconds on this. Without objection. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, gladly you again uh, co-introduce this important bill because your life uh, is very, very important. And there have been many, many instances uh, in the District of Columbia uh, where someone had a culinary, culinary arrest and, 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 and couldn't do it. So I support this in our public schools. And I think, Ms. Sanders, I want to extend it to our charter schools, too. So that young people, it does. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, co-sponsors. Councilmember Bonds, Councilmember, Councilmember Orange, Councilmember Bonds, are you co-sponsoring this? Okay, Councilmember Orange, Councilmember Che, Councilmember. Thank you. Oh. Councilmember uh, Wells. Uh, Councilmember Bonds, you're a co-introducer. That's what you were yeah, trying to exactly. tell me. Okay. Uh, this bill will be referred sequentially first to the Committee on Education and then the Committee on Judiciary with Chairman, comments from the Committee on Health. me too, please? Thanks. Mr. Grasso will also be listed as a co-sponsor. Uh, further, Councilmember Alexander? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Along with Council Members Evans and Barry, I'm introducing the Income-Based Home Ownership Tax Abatement Amendment Act of 2013. Currently, the Office of Tax and Revenue offers a five-year real property tax exemption for qualified first-time home buyers through the Lower Income Home Ownership Exemption Program. This program was established to create an incentive for first-time buyers to purchase a home here in our city as opposed to neighboring jurisdictions. According to the Office of mm -hmm. Tax and Revenue data, at the end of 2011, yeah. there were 3,121 families participating in the program. The program currently caps income levels at 120% of lower income guidelines as established by the Department of Housing and Urban Development which allows lower and middle class families to participate. 
For instance, under the current rate, a single person who makes no more than 56100 would be eligible for the program, and a family of four that makes no more than 80100 would also be eligible. The district is one of the few jurisdictions that has maintained a strong housing market despite the overall economic landscape across the country. As such, this bill is aimed at encouraging more families to become homeowners in the district. As such, this bill is aimed at encouraging, oh, I'm sorry, often prospective home buyers are intimidated by the home prices and property taxes. So this bill that I'm introducing today would increase that income cap by 20%. So now a single person who makes no more than $65,450 and a family of four making no more than $93,450 would qualify for this program. This bill will entice even more home buyers to purchase in the district because they will be exempt from paying property taxes on homes priced under 367000 for the first five years of ownership. This legislation will provide many benefits to the district as it promotes and strengthens home ownership and broadens our tax base and it helps to grow our neighborhoods. It especially supports home ownership in economic development zones east of the river and in Ward 7 where homes are priced relatively, well, moderate, not low. Uh, this legislation is another opportunity for government to encourage home ownership while supporting our working class neighbors. And I welcome any co-sponsors. And, and, and co-introducers, Council Member Evans and Barry, if they would like to speak. Thank you, Mr. On Chairman. Time. Well, the time's expired for inter the introduction. Are there co-sponsors? Do we have a couple of seconds, Mr. Mr. Chairman? Um, if, there's, if there's no objection, Mr. Barry. Mr. Chairman, thank you very, very much, and Ms. Alexander, uh, for including me and co-introducing it. This is particularly needed in Ward 8 because we only have 25% home ownership in Ward 8. 75% of the families are renters, and so I, again, uh, Mr. Alexander, thank you very much for uh, including me in this, and we certainly want to get it passed. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Our co-sponsors on this bill, Councilmember Bonds, Councilmember Bowser, Councilmember Che, Councilmember Wells. This bill will be referred to the Committee on Finance and Revenue. Mr. Graham is also a co-sponsor of this bill. Uh, uh, Councilmember McDuffie is a co-sponsor of this bill. Um, I believe that's your three bills, Councilmember. No, Alexander. my last one coming up. Councilmember Alexander. Yeah, this is the last introduction, along with Council Members Evans, McDuffie, Che, and Barry. Uh, the Social Impact Financing Amendment Act of 2013. Social impact bonds are sometimes referred to as pay for success bonds or social benefit bonds. And they're an innovative financing tool that can be used by the district government to better, to better stewards of taxpayer dollars as we continue to work to improve social outcomes in our residents and communities. Social impact bonds are contracts made between the government and a private sector or nonprofit organization in which the non-government entity is tasked with improving specific social outcomes. Most often, social impact bonds are used to combat issues related to health, education, recidivism, and unemployment. The difference in social impact bonds and typical contracts to com to combat these issues is that the non-government entity is not entitled to payment from the government until a specific predetermined set of measurable outcomes have been met. For instance, if an organization enters into a social impact bond and agrees to help reduce the occurrences of recidivism in minors by 10% over a predetermined number of period of time, the organization would not be entitled to payment from the district until an objective, independent evaluator determines that the 
qualitative performance targets have been achieved as agreed upon. The non-government entity is financed by an outside investor and can only be repaid if the organization meets specific targets triggering payment by the government. This bill allows the Office of Contracts and Procurement, the appropriate agency, the option um, to use the social impact bonds as an efficient tool when issuing RFPs and entering into contracts at, with service providers for all kind of human care and social services, such as fighting obesity, chronic homeless, homelessness, child asthma rates, truancy, drug prevention, and, and so on. Far too often, the, the district has paid various organizations thousands, even millions of dollars to help address various societal ills, and we've received little to no return on our investment. So this will be a tool uh, to, to use that will encourage people to be accountable when we get, you know, when they receive all of this government funding. And I have eight seconds, so Council Member Barry, if you would like to add something to this. Chairman, I won't uh, exceed the time now. I would just associate myself with those great remarks from my distinguished council member from Ward 7. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Um, Co-sponsors, Councilmember Bonds, Councilmember Bowser, Councilmember Graham, Councilmember Grasso, this bill will be referred to the Committee of the Whole. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Graham. Once again, I mean, this, uh, this impacts the agencies within the Committee on Human Services, so I'd like you to consider a referral to, to the Committee on Human Services. Um, well, it amends the Procurement Practices Reform Act. Oh. And uh, it says uh, on page two, notwithstanding any other provision of this chapter, the CPO, that's the Chief Procurement Officer, may award a social impact bond contract if, and then it goes on. And uh, Office of Contracting and Procurement is under the Committee of the Whole this council period. That's the reason why. So the referral will be with the Committee of the Whole. Thank, thank you, Mr. Graham. Anything further with regard to introductions? Then we will proceed to the uh, consent agenda. We already approved item 7A, which was the ceremonial resolutions. 7D, uh, which is the Board of Zoning Adjustment, Catherine Allen was removed from the consent agenda during consideration in the Committee of the Whole. So what is before us now is 7E at the bottom of page 2 through 7G at the top of page 4. Are there any changes to the consent agenda? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Barry. Chairman, I'd like to uh, take E1, Congressional the uh, Workforce Job Development Grant Making Authority Congressional Review Emergency Declaration of 2013. I certainly have supported, but I wanted to have an opportunity to speak to it at the proper time. Uh, thank you. Uh, I heard another voice. Mr. Chairman. Councilmember Alexander. Um, if you would remove on page 3, F1, the Medical Marijuana Cultivation Center Temporary Amendment. Uh -huh. Uh, further? All right, we have uh, before us the consent agenda. Remembering that the ceremonials were already approved, what we have before us is basically page three of the agenda and item one on page four at the top of page four. That's the consent agenda. All those in favor of the consent agenda say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Uh, the next item is PR 20-7, Board of Zoning Adjustment, S. Catherine Allen, Confirmation Resolution of 2013. I presented this at the Committee of the Whole earlier today. I move the uh, resolution discussion. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Grasso. I just wanted to restate the reasons why I'm not going to be supporting this uh, confirmation today. Uh, you know, uh, 
For me, I think it's very important that we take a close look at every single nomination and when it impacts the Board of Zoning Adjustment, which has a profound impact on the way that our city kind of evolves over the next several years, I think it's important for us to be very careful who we put on these uh, various boards and commissions. In this particular case, um, I have uh, raised previously my concern that the nominee is uh, not uh, as progressive a candidate as I'd like to see in this position when it comes to the growth of our city. Um, and as a result, I'm just uh, here to, to let you know that I'm going to be voting against this nomination. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Krause. For further discussion? All those in favor Mr. of Chairman, P Mr. Uh, Chairman, Mr. Bowser. Chairman, uh, I just want to restate, um, and I had the opportunity to make these comments in the, in the committee of the whole, but I think it's uh, worth repeating um, here. Uh, I had the opportunity to to have reviewed a number of VZA applicants over my five years on the council, and again to um, to speak with Miss Allen, um, and I just found her her level of expertise to be exceptional, um, and her understanding of of, uh, our neighborhoods to be equally exceptional. Um, and so we know that the, the folks that we appoint to these boards um, have very important responsibilities to, to balance um, our development and, and property owners' uh, needs as well as the, the needs of, uh, of our of neighborhoods in our growing city. Um, so I am, I am extremely confident um, in Ms. Allen's ability to do exactly that, and I'm going to be voting for her today. Mr. Chairman. Mr. McDuffie. That's Mr. Orange. I'm sorry, Mr. Orange? Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I rise to uh, ditto the comments of uh, the councilman from Ward 4, Muriel Bowser. I've had the opportunity to know uh, Ms. Catherine Allen for at least a, a decade uh, when she was the banking commissioner, and she did an extremely uh, uh, outstanding job uh, during that time of service. And then I was really... Um, really impressed with her when she started her own company. I believe it's Answer Title Company. Mm -hmm. And she's been involved with that for a, a number of years. And throughout her time that I've known her, I've not heard anything um, uh, adverse to her abilities and to her commitment to the city. So I wholeheartedly will be supporting uh, her confirmation. And I ask my colleagues to support her as well. Thank you, Mr. Orange. Uh, if there's no further discussion, the uh, vote is on PR 20-7. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, no. Please record me as no, too. Thank you. All right. The vote, uh, the motion passes with Mr. Grasso voting no. Uh, next is um, Work for uh, item E1 on page, bottom of page two, workforce job development grant making authority congressional review emergency declaration resolution of 2013. On the declaration, Mr. Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to move the workforce job development grant making authority congressional review act of 2013. There exists a need to improve the grant making process. As you know, Mr. Chairman, I'm chair of the uh, committee which has the Department of Employment Services on it. Thank you for that. And we want to try to develop a process for training other services for unemployed district residents. You may already be aware of the permanent legislation, B19-619, has already been approved by the council on second reading on December 18, 2012. The temporary has expired and the permanent is awaiting congressional review and is not expected to become law until sometime in April of next year. Thus, in order to prevent a gap in illegal authority, this emergency has been put forward. We do all we can to make the grant making process smoother because uh, right now it's not as smooth as it ought to be. And while we delay on it in grant making, people are suffering because of unemployment. So I'm share my original support and the members of the council on this very important emergency. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Uh, further discussion on the declaration? All those in favor of the declaration say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. The ayes have it unanimously. On the emergency act, Mr. Perry. I move the, move the act, Mr. Chairman. Discussion. 
All those in favor of the, this is the Workforce Job Development Grant Making Authority Congressional Review Emergency Act of 2013. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Uh, on page three at the bottom, F1. Uh, Medical Marijuana Cultivation Center Temporary Amendment Act of 2013, Bill 20-18. This is the final vote on this temporary bill. Councilmember Alexander. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The underlying uh, temporary bill on second reading prohibits cultivation centers from being located in retail priority areas and applied only to those applications that were pending as of April 7, 2012. This amendment would grant those pending applicants an additional 180 days from the effective date of this temporary to find an alternate location uh, and to amend the applications without harm. So I would appreciate my colleagues' support and so move, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have an amendment before us. Mr. Chairman. If there's Mr. No Chairman, I uh, on the amendment because I would amendment. ask for unanimous consent on the amendment. Chairman, I have like the bill. Mr. Chairman, I, mean, I have a couple of comments. I'm going to support this. I just want to put these on the record that the uh, Department of Health is way behind in this process of medical marijuana. Uh, they we, we we got into this enthusiastically, and thus far. And I told them this a couple of days ago that they've only approved one licensure for cultivation and no licenses for uh, distribution, which means that this cultivation center is up and running, and I support Mr. Alexander here on that. That means they have no source of, uh, of uh, marijuana. So I uh, just want to point that out. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Is there any objection to the amendment? Hearing none, then the amendment is accepted. On the, um, the bill itself as amended, further discussion? All those in favor of the bill say aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Uh, please record Mr. Catania and myself as voting no. And Councilmember Che as voting no. Uh, the measure passes. The uh, next item on the agenda is um, on the non-consent agenda, uh, item 8C1, Sense of the Council regarding Citizens United and Fair Elections Resolution of 2013. Councilmember Grasso. Today that the Supreme Court in a 5-4 to four decision known as Citizens United unleashed a torrent of money into campaigns. For the first time in more than a century, corporations are allowed to dip into their funds to spend money directly influencing elections. Our democracy is of, by, and for the people, not of, bought, and paid for by special interests. Corporations are entitled to certain privileges under law, like limited liability, perpetual life, but never before until Citizens United did we give corporations a constitutional right to bankroll political campaigns. As Justice Stevens wrote in the dissent of this law, corporations, quote, are not themselves members of we the people by whom and for whom our Constitution was established. Corporations do not have a constitutional right to vote, and they should not have a constitutional right to spend unlimited amounts of money influencing legislations, end quote. Numerous cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, Annapolis, New York, Philadelphia, and hundreds of others have demanded that Congress pass a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United. Surely Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, should join this long list. I hope that all my colleagues will, colleagues will join me in voting for this sense of the council. Uh, I understand that you have an amendment on some of the language, Mr. Chairman, um, and uh, once it's uh, distributed, I'll be accepting that as friendly. Okay, thank you, Mr. Grasso. Uh, there is an amendment in the nature of a substitute, which is being circulated, but I believe it also was in the folder circulated yesterday. And the, um, the gist of the amendment is that the language uh, or the um, thrust of the, of the sense of the council resolution remains unchanged, that it is the sense of the council uh, that Congress uh, 
begin the process for a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. Is there any objection to the amendment? Uh, you can accept it as friendly, but the question object, is yeah. whether there's any objection. Got it. Hearing no objection, then the amendment Mr. is... Mr. Chairman, yes. can you just restate your amendment, please? Uh, the amendment, uh, what the amendment does is it softens some of the strident language in the uh, original resolution, but uh, the th gist of it remains unchanged, that it is the sense of the council that... Uh, the Council respectfully disagrees with the majority opinion and decision of the United States Supreme Court and Citizens United that the Congress should propose and send to the states for ratification a constitutional amendment to overturn Citizens United with regard to corporate influence in elections. If there's no objection, the uh, amendment is accepted. The motion before us is the uh, resolution as amended. Further discussion? All those in favor of the resolution as amended say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Uh, next is um, PR 20-11, the Reimbursable Detail Officer Subsidy Program Resolution of Approval Resolution of 2013. <coughs> Mr. Graham. Th thank you very much. Uh, I'm moving this resolution today on behalf of the Committee on Human Services. Uh, this resolution was introduced on November the 6th by uh, you, Chairman Mendelson, at the request of the mayor. The bill was referred to our committee. I held a public roundtable on January the 24th at which the director of the Alcoholic Beverage Regulation Administration testified in support of the proposed rule. Uh, there were no other witnesses and no other testimony was submitted. Uh, this is on the agenda pursuant to Rule 9339, which allows a proposed resolution to bypass the Committee of the Whole. ABRA rulemaking uh, provides that proposed rules be submitted to the Council for a 90-day review period. The Council has the authority to approve or disapprove the proposed rules in whole or part, but we cannot, we cannot modify the rules. Uh, it would be deemed disapproved, however, on February the 14th, uh, unless the Council acts. Um, this, this rule approves, uh, this rule would establish in regulation the reimbursement rate for the reimbursable police officer program, as well as the days and hours when the program operates. I authored this original legislation, and the council passed it, which established the police reimbursable detail officer program. Uh, it has been a highly successful program. And to protect the public safety in the wee hours of the weekends, and we can all take pride in it. Uh, they are off-duty police officers who help maintain peace, order, and quiet and safety outside of nightlife establishments on the weekends. The program is run by the Metropolitan Police Department, the nightlife establishment, and in some cases a group of businesses through a business improvement district pay 50% of the cost of this, these police services. But the remaining 50% is a subsidy by the D.C. taxpayer, which is, to my mind, money very well spent. Recently, as a result of a spending pressure, for a brief period of time, the rate was dropped to 25 percent. But now we have adequate funding, and we've had adequate funding, to return it to a 50 percent subsidy in FY12. Um, this, this rate is now going to be established by the rulemaking, and the hours are extended until 5 a.m. in line with the new hours a few days a year that allows certain bars to open until 4 a.m. So I think this is a very good rule, and we should proceed to approve it, Mr. Chairman. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Um, I believe before we go further, I have to ask several questions of the officers. Uh, first, um, Mr. General Counsel, is the measure legally and technically sufficient for our consideration? Yes, it is. Madam Secretary, is the record complete? Yes, it is. Uh, Madam Budget Director, does the measure's fiscal impact statement comply with Council requirements? Yes, it does. Thank you. And I ask those questions now because this is here as a 339. Uh, discussion on the resolution. All those in favor of PR 20-11, uh, the Reimbursable Detail Officer Subsidy Program Resolution of Approval Resolution of 2013, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Next item is Visitability Requirements Temporary Amendment Act of 2012, Bill 19-1097. 
It's before us as a final reading on this temporary bill. Uh, I am, um, I move to table this bill. Discussion on the motion to table. All those in favor, of, yeah, Mr. Orange? Sorry, Mr. Chairman, uh, what bill are you moving to table? Uh, this is item D1 on page four, Visitability Requirements Temporary Amendment Act of 2012. Table's not discussed. He's asking where, where we are. Uh, all those in favor of the motion to table say aye. Aye. Opposed? The uh, ayes have it unanimously. Uh, next is um, a reading and vote on emergency legislation. First, Board of Ethics and Government Accountability Emergency Declaration Resolution of 2013. Councilmember McDuffie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to withdraw. Uh, item number one, Board of Ethics and Government Accountability Emergency Declaration Resolution of 2013, uh, as well as item number two on page four, Pro Prohibition on Government Employing Political Engagement Activity Emergency Declaration Resolution of 2013. All right. Um, item one has been withdrawn. And item two, which I had not yet called, uh, which is the Prohibition on Government Employee Engagement and Political Activity, is also withdrawn. Uh, next is uh, Medical Marijuana Cultivation Center and Dispensary Location Restriction Emergency Declaration Resolution of 2013. Councilmember McDuffie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, this legislation is identical um, to a permanent bill that I introduced in January. The reason for the emergency being considered today is that the Department of Health has informed my office that it is considering soliciting a new round of applications for additional medical marijuana cultivation centers and dispensaries. While I and many residents of Ward 5 support uh, the medical marijuana program to address chronic illnesses, we have concerns about the implementation of the program. Specifically, Ward 5 residents are concerned about the number of facilities in the war. Currently, five of the six approved cultivation centers are located in Ward 5, as is one of the four approved dispensaries. To facilitate the equitable distribution of cultivation centers and dispensaries throughout the city and to avoid an overconcentration in any one particular ward, Emergency legislation is necessary to limit the number of facilities in each ward prior to the next round of applications. This measure would set a cap at two dispensaries per ward, but only one dispensary in a ward where there are already five cultivation centers registered to operate. The maximum number of cultivation centers per ward will be capped at six. Uh, this legislation is similar to the legislation that this council voted unanimously to support uh, in 2012. Uh, at this point, Mr. Chair, I move the declaration. Uh, discussion on the declaration. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Berry. Uh, as I uh, indicated earlier, I've had some discussion with Dr. Waldo and people over at Health about the uh, four uh, unawarded applications for cultivation. And they told me that either the day or tomorrow, they'll have a new round of uh, applicants coming in. Uh, and I've indicated the desire of some of the people in Ward 8, me in particular, of having two of those in Ward 8. So uh, I want to support Mr. McDuffie so we can at least keep the status quo because there may be efforts on part of some applicants to go to Ward 5 when they know they can't go. So Mr. McDuffie, I support you on this. Uh, further discussion? Uh, I, I want to speak to this for a moment. Um, the, um, I, I had voted against a temporary bill that was uh, preceded this a few moments ago. Uh, and uh, I sort of want to explain my reason for that and where I am on this, this item before us now. Uh, members will recall that in the 1990s, voters overwhelmingly voted for an initiative to establish uh, or permit medical marijuana in the District of Columbia. Uh, it took well over 10 years before Congress uh, relaxed restrictions that they had placed, I think, unfairly and undemocratically on that voter initiative. And in council period 18, Mr. Catania took the lead, but he as chair then of the Committee on Health and I then as chair of judiciary worked on legislation so that we could implement a very carefully crafted medical marijuana program in the District of Columbia. It has been well over two years, and we still don't have the medical marijuana program off the ground in the district. 
And I don't know that it's fair to blame the Department of Health. This is a difficult issue, and, and they need to roll this program out carefully. What we have seen in other jurisdictions, most notably or infamously California, is that a program like this can be uh, handled, implemented so loosely that there's enormous abuse. And the, the law that Mr. Catania took the lead on and I worked on uh, was carefully crafted to limit that abuse. Now there continues to be the concern on the part of some citizens that somehow that this is going to, this implementation of this legislation is going to open our streets to a lot of pot smoking criminals. Far from it. This, this program is very limited, extremely limited, and it is for those folks who have a medical need, a real medical need, not a supposed, not a purported medical need. That's what this program is about. Furthermore, the law and the regulations establish such a level of security, and there's already such a limited number of facilities that I really think that the harm to neighborhoods is um, being vastly overstated. Now, having said all that, I think it's important that there is a, some time to continue to work through some unease, uh, which is clear from the fact that we've dealt with this already several times this council period through introduction of legislation as well as these and other emergencies, that I will support this declaration. I'd urge other members to support this declaration today. but. I've, I've made this statement because I think members need to realize that this program is very limited and is actually very secure, very secure, and that the concerns that we are hearing, in my view, and I strongly believe this, are being overstated. And uh, if we want medical marijuana as voted by the voters in the 1998 initiative to be implemented, we have, we have got to uh, let this get off the ground. Thank you. Chairman. Further discussion, Mr. Catania. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I want to associate myself with your remarks um, because I'm threading the needle exactly as you are. The uh, issue of the previous emergency where the council gets into the issue of picking exactly which specific location is or is not acceptable I think is an overreach. Uh, as you mentioned, when the council considered the, the bill that ultimately uh, made medical marijuana legal in the district, we were very careful to balance community concerns, uh, insert ANC concerns, and uh, an opportunity to comment, and to have what, what I believe to be a, a very secure but very balanced um, and humane uh, reaction uh, to this issue. Um, Mr. Chairman, I think I have the distinction of living closer to a, to a dispensary than anybody on this council. There's one just a short walk from my house uh, so that when it is opened, it will be uh, a fixture in my community. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the reason I'll be supporting Mr. McDuffie's emergency here is because it does seek to distribute, uh, perhaps for reasons that are different than introduced, but I hope it will have the impact and effect of moving dispensaries and cultivation centers around the city as opposed to cultivating them or to concentrating them in one particular community. Uh, not because I believe in any way, shape, or form that cultivation centers or dispensaries, the way they are organized and monitored, managed, and regulated, will produce a nuisance far from it. I believe we, we do need to take efforts to distribute them around the city so individuals who are suffering from conditions that uh, would be alleviated by medical marijuana will have them closer to their homes. And so that could be a collateral uh, consequence that I think is a benefit of Mr. McDuffie's um, measure, Mr. Chairman. But I want to underscore that I reject the notion that a, a dispensary or a cultivation center, the way they are managed and regulated uh, under this regime, will pr produce a nuisance to a community. It, they will not. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Katan. Is there any discussion on this, Mr. Orange? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will be supporting uh, this emergency and, and the declaration. And clearly, I want to say I believe that all of us support the medical marijuana program. The issue here is really just locations. The fact that five of the six cultivation centers are located in Ward 5, that is the issue, not the medical marijuana program. It's that five of the six are located in Ward 5, and there is also a dispensary in Ward 5. So what we are talking about now is now let's spread this throughout the city and, and make sure that there is a good distribution 
where all the citizens of the District of Columbia can, in fact, have access to medical marijuana. Now, the residents of, of War 5, they are particularly disturbed because now you have the Ivy City uh, 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 um, issue as, as it relates to the, uh, the, the, the buses being parked at Cromwell School. You have the issue of, uh, of, of a number of strip clubs being located in Ward 5. Now you have the five cultivation centers. And according to uh, Councilman McDuffie, he has received communications from the uh, Department of Health that there will be another round. And what we're saying is that in Ward 5, uh, Ward 5 has, in fact, embraced this program, has embraced the locations. Now it's time for the other wards. There are eight wards that make up the District of Columbia, not just Ward 5. And it's also uh, clear that last week, uh, Mayor Gray and uh, Councilman McDuffie, they formed a task force to examine the, the industrial uses of, of Ward 5 to make sure that Ward 5 also has an opportunity to participate in the economic resurgence of the, of the nation's capital. And we want to m make sure that, uh, you know, positive things are, are happening. There's positive things now going on in Ward 4. There's positive things now going on east of the river. So let's have the spread out and make sure that everybody has the opportunity to participate in these social policies that provide assistance to people that need it but let's not overburden a community. No community should have to have all the miracle marijuana facilities, all the strip clubs, all the buses, you know, and all these projects in their one location. Uh, and so I think that's the essence of what is being said here. There is no attack. Let me say again. There is no attack on the medical marijuana program. And uh, I, will, I will be supporting this, and I will be supporting uh, the temporary as well. As you know, I was the original author uh, of this legislation um, uh, back in, in council period uh, 19. So, uh, you know, we just want to work together to make sure there is an even distribution of these facilities throughout the District of Columbia. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Orange. Uh, Mr. Graham, did you want to be recognized? You know, I, I really appreciate the points that are being made, but I, I can't. You know, I, the only way you can buy into this type of limitation is that if you become convinced that there is a negative associated with these dispensaries. And we have people arriving with a medical prescription issued by a doctor for a medical condition. I mean, this is, I don't, I, I fail to see just what the negative is, what the nuisance quality is. And I hear people saying that they'll support this legislation even though they see no nuisance, even they see no problem with this. I mean, we have regulated to the point of extreme care medical marijuana in the District of Columbia. I was an advocate for this program when I was executive director of the Whitman Walker Clinic. And it's extremely important to those who need it and can medically justify it. So I don't know how, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with the chairman because until you, unless you buy into the notion that there's a nuisance quality to this, certainly a strip club has such a quality because you know that the type of audience that is being attracted in part to that establishment. But I don't see the same qualities associated with these medical facilities. And thus, uh, I don't know how I can support this without concluding that. I mean, if you say, well, this is going to help distribute these facilities throughout the, the, the wards of the city, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that's possibly true. But the fact of the matter is there still has to, there's still a neighborhood reaction that says, we don't want this in our neighborhood. We don't want this in our backyard. And to that statement, I ask, why not? What is it about these facilities that's going to be a problem for you? And once you get to that level of questioning, you find out that, well, people with a medical prescription to just to satisfy a medical need, in this particular instance, don't carry that type of nuisance problem with them. So I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to support this, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Further discussion? Uh, Mr. Orange, second round. Yes. Well, I, I think I would just say that, you know, you don't have five CVSs located in the same location. You don't have five Safeways in the same location. And that's what the issue is here. In Ward 5, there are five of the six cultivation centers located in that ward. 
So once again, this is not a knock on the medical marijuana program. This is about distribution and making sure that everyone has access. And, uh, you know, if, if I lived over in Ward 3, I would not want to have to go all the way over to Ward 5 to get my prescription filled. I would like to get my prescription filled in the neighborhood where I, where I reside. I would like to buy my groceries in the neighborhoods where I reside. I would like for my children to go to school in the neighborhood where I reside. And so that's what this is about. This is about making sure that we provide the opportunity for everyone to have access to this program, a program that uh, uh, clearly is very, very beneficial, and the citizens of the District of Columbia have voted in favor of the program. Uh, so uh, once again, uh, I do not believe that anyone here is stating that this is a nuisance. We know it is not a nuisance. It is, it is something that is helpful to a population of people that need it. You know, you never know when you may need, need that prescription, and you just want to have access to go and have your prescription filled throughout the entire District of Columbia and not just one location. So I, once again, I will be voting in Mr. favor Chairman. of Mr. Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to Mr. just uh, cl clarify the record, if, if I might. And again, um, when, when my colleague mentions that there are five uh, cultivation centers, uh, what is absent from that discussion is the fact that, that they are located that, that they are located in the same building. In other words, of, of the five, you have four that are located in two buildings. So you have five facilities strung throughout the ward. You have three. You have two cultivation centers on the first and second floor. So it's not as if there are, is, there are five facilities. There are three separate facilities that are in warehouse districts that are zoned for that purpose. They're not in the middle of residential areas and and I support w the direction that Mr. McDuffie uh, is moving Mr. Chairman uh, but I, I want to be clear that I do associate myself with Mr. Graham's remarks that there from my viewpoint there are no uh, negative consequences from having a dispensary or a cultivation center in one's community and I underscore that by saying that if I, I, I may be mistaken but I live or will live a block and a half from one of the few dispensaries that we will have. So I don't believe there's a single member here on this council who lives closer to a dispensary than me. And I think that is fitting as the author of the bill. And by the way, I have no concern or, or fear whatsoever. In fact, I'm gratified that my neighbors will have access to medical marijuana in close proximity to where they live. Thank you. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Evans. Chairman. Chairman, I move to close the debate. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to move to close debate. <laughs> Me too. Motion has been made to close debate, which is not debatable. The effect of which is that um, anybody who has not spoken will be able to speak. In the and second round, the Mr. Mover Chairman, right? of the motion will be able to speak. Chairman, I can. All those in favor of the motion to close debate, say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Uh, the ayes have it unanimously. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Spouser, Chairman. Did you want to be recognized? Did you call me? Yes. Thank you. Um, well, Mr. Chairman, I just want to uh, kind of, I'm, I'm troubled by this, but one thing that I would, I would like to say is that I hope that we can have um, kind of deal with this issue once and for all instead of dealing with it by emergency. Because every time it comes up, I'm not quite sure what the change is from the last time um, it came up. Um, and so like everyone has stated, we have been supportive of medical marijuana in the District of Columbia. Um, and like has also been stated, there are many communities that sometimes have uh, more of a use than others. Like, for example, we have more group homes um, for that serve people with disabilities in Ward 4, which we hear a lot about concentration issues uh, around. Uh, I am uh, supportive of Mr. McDuffie's efforts for the, the Industrial Use Task Force. Um, I think actually I uh, was disappointed to see that it didn't include other uh, parts of the city as well because we know that everyone will be in impacted um, by that. That work. So uh, like you, Mr. Chairman, I will um, 
I will support this today, but I also would encourage all of the relevant committees um, to be involved in finding out where the gaps are in the law and having one piece of legislation that deals with any gaps um, that we'll find. The second point I like to make is we're talking about cultivation centers and dispensaries like they're one and the same. Um, it's my understanding and the mover of the legislation can um, clarify or correct me that the cultivation center is actually like the, the back end of the operation. It's, it's basically a warehouse. It doesn't have any back and forth traffic um, related to people coming up um, every day. The dispensary, on the other hand, is the retail um, side of the operation where there is and we should expect more traffic and activity um, around um, those activities. So I think it's important um, that we say if, if we're talking about a, a warehouse operation, um, that you might expect it in areas where there are warehouses. Um, the dispensaries, we, we should expect um, the arguments been made that we want um, them spread out around the city, and that's uh, certainly where people will have more access, uh, and we should encourage, for sure, um, the dispensary locations. We have put in place some very strict rules around where both can be located, um, and so if we're concerned about access throughout the city, especially for dispensaries, um, I would encourage the committee uh, to make sure that we the rules um, and any incentives would support um, would support that desire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. McDuffie. Mr. Chairman, I give uh, Mr. Barry. You you spoke already in first. Mr. Round. Orange started the second round, Mr. Chairman. That's correct. And a motion. I'd like to be in line for the you, second round. You can't because a motion to close debate was moved and approved, was adopted after Mr. Orange spoke. Mr. Chairman. And therefore, anybody who'd already spoken could not speak again, except yeah, for the maker of the motion. that is not right, but you said That's it to the rule. me. Wait That's a minute, the not the rule. What you said was that Mr. Orange started the second round. And so it seems to me that those of us who spoke in the first round uh, and want to speak on the second round ought to have an opportunity to do so. The motion to close debate, which was adopted, um, stop that. Are you, that was are you the effect saying of the that motion the, to close debate. Because Mr. Owens started that. second round, those of us who wanted to be in line before the debate was voted upon can't speak. Correct. Well, that was the effect of the council voting to close debate. The only person after that motion was adopted who can speak a second time is the maker of the motion, which in this case is Mr. McDuffie. Mr. Owens spoke sec a second time. Prior to that uh, motion to close debate being adopted. I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to quibble about that, but uh, I think it's not proper, but I'm not going to do anything about that. I support uh, Mr. McDuffie. Mr. That's, McDuffie. That's what I want to vote on. Thank you, and I appreciate that, Council Member uh, Barry, as well as the other Council Members for their comments. Uh, I think, you know, all the comments that we heard uh, on this, this, this bill speaks less to sort of the disagreement uh, on this body and, and more toward the importance of this, of this bill and importance of standing up a medical marijuana program that allows the uh, access uh, to the people who really need it. I think everybody wants that. Uh, it's, it's obviously my desire to make sure that we see that through as well. Uh, and it's also important, I want to note, that we have the support of, of Council Member Catania as well as Chairman Mendelson, uh, who over the years have worked uh, on this program. And so uh, I don't want to discount that. And I, and, I, and I really appreciate all the comments we've heard thus far from all the members. Uh, 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 particularly the members who, who have decided to support this emergency. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. McDuffie. All right, we have the uh, measure before us. This is the declaration. The Medical Marijuana Cultivation Center and Dispensary Location Restriction Emergency Declaration Resolution of 2013. All those in favor of the declaration say aye. 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 Opposed? Mr. Graham, do you want to be recorded as voting no? All right, the measure, the measure passes, Mr. Graham, uh, voting no. On the bill itself, Mr. McDuffie. So moved, Mr. Chair. Discussion? All those in favor of the Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Barry? Mr. Chairman, as I said earlier, I'm going to support this, but I wanted to point out to the body that this program is in serious trouble. Uh, as, as you pointed out, Mr. Chairman, it, it was, took 10 years to get there. And then it's been two years since we passed it, thanks to Mr. Uh, uh, Catania and yourself. 
And what we're finding, the reason I know a lot about this is because I want two cultivation centers in Ward 8, so I ask questions. But they're finding out that a number of applicants didn't know the economic pressure on them. And so unless we resolve that, and also 90 plants is not enough to make it uh, feasible. So I think we've got to go beyond Mr. McDuffie's desire now in this council. Uh, Mr. Chairman, has to get busy look at the whole program because it's, it's faltering. Do no fault of anybody except the health department. That's all I want to say. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Uh, further discussion on the bill? Mr. Chairman. Councilmember Alexander. Thank you. I'll, I'll be really brief. I think the whole, <clears throat> I guess the whole um, concern is is that when this was voted on referendum, okay, the citizens of the District of Columbia did vote and approve medicinal marijuana. However, at the time, the regulations were not put in place. So everyone was in favor of this whole notion or concept, but unfortunately, the regulations weren't put in place, and that's another issue. So now that the regulations are put in place, then people had concerns with regards to the locations, the numbers, and what have you, and that's where this is coming from. So fundamentally, we do approve or, or agree with the whole concept, but the regulations are the, I guess, the, the, the point that we disagree on, and, and that's the issue. So I think fundamentally we're all in support of it. But the regulations, you know, we may have wanted some minor changes to that. So thank you. And I will support um, Council Member McDuffie's initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Alexander. Further discussion? All right, the uh, vote is on the Medical Marijuana Cultivation Center and Dispensary Location Restriction Emergency Amendment Act of 2013. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, Mr. Graham will be recorded as voting no. The measure passes. Uh, next is the Tax Revision Commission Report Extension and Procurement Streamlining Emergency Declaration Resolution of 2013. I circulated the notice for this, uh, and it was um, I'm moving this at the request of former uh, Mayor Anthony Williams, who's the chair of the Tax Revision Commission. The um, I believe we also have the, uh, we're also circulating the um, fiscal impact statement. Um, the purpose of this legislation is to extend the deadline for the final report of the Tax Revision Commission to allow the Commission to procure goods and services and to allow the uh, Commission to procure goods and services independent of the Chief Procurement Officer and to authorize the limited use of a streamlined small purchase procurement process for contracts for goods and services not exceeding $40,000. The Commission is in the process of obtaining discrete reports by experts on specific tax issues. The typical procurement process impedes the Commission's ability to obtain these reports easily and quickly. The Commission has a deadline. And uh, the deadline, I'm trying to get some clarification on it. Uh, the deadline was originally um, nine months after the council, uh, after uh, uh, the legislation adopted by the council became law. It became law in September of 2011. Nine months would have been last May. However, not all of the appointments were completed until um, last May. And nine months from that date would have been this February, this month. I believe we've extended it once already. This uh, emergency would extend it further to September 30th, 2013. So, in short, this would facilitate the Commission's ability to hire tax experts for very low cost contracts, let's say twenty, thirty thousand dollars There's a cap of $40,000. Uh, without going through the uh, typical procurement process, and also would extend the deadline for the Commission's work to September 30th of this year. I move the declaration. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Grasso. 
I just want to speak in support of this uh, this act and the uh, following uh, emergency as well. You know, this uh, work of the Tax Review Commission is extremely important for the District of Columbia. And uh, when I've spoken to the former Mayor Williams about the work they're undertaking, um, I'm really heartened to hear that he's going to come back with some concrete recommendations for the council on how we can reform the way that we uh, collect taxes and uh, the taxes that we collect in D.C. Um, I think it's also important that uh, you've uh, put the deadline at September 30th in the sense that we'll have time then to uh, pull these before the council uh, before the next budget pro uh, process begins. So uh, thank you very much, and I just wanted to speak in support. Thank you, Mr. Grasso. Further discussion? Uh, the the uh, vote is on the Tax Revision Commission Report Extension and Procurement Streamlining Emergency Declaration Resolution of 2013. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. On the Emergency Act, uh, I move it. Discussion? All those in favor of the Emergency Act say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. The next item is the Department of Fire and Emergency Medical Services Inaugural Overtime Clarification Emergency Declaration Resolution of 2013. The, um, as the notice um, of this emergency that was circulated last week indicated, when the Council adopted the Budget Support Amendment Act of um, 2012 for fiscal year 2013, it once again included limitations on overtime, uh, restrictions on overtime uh, with regard to the Fire and EMS Department. Um, there was included in that legislation an exemption from those limitations during pay periods one and two of calendar year 2013, corresponding with the presidential inauguration. Pay periods one and two were specified by the Office of the Chief Financial Officer, who now indicates that they made a mistake and that the correct pay periods were not one and two, but pay periods two and three. That is the effect of this emergency legislation is to correct that mistake by the Office of the Chief Financial Officer. I move the declaration. Discussion? All those in favor of the declaration say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. On the act, uh, so moved. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. We will turn now to uh, emergency legislation at the request of the mayor. The first is contract DCPO-2008-T-0001 dash 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 emergency declaration resolution of 2013. This is with J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. Councilmember McDuffie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today on behalf of the mayor, I'm moving contract DCPO dash 2008 dash t dash 0076 emergency declaration resolution of 2013 and contract dcpo dash 2008 dash t dash 0076 emergency <laughs> approval act uh, this measure addresses the immediate need to approve a multi-year contract through an approved mem memorandum of understanding with the united states department of justice to tag its task order with jp morgan chase bank the contract will provide district agencies commercial card services for purchase and travel cards under the General Services Administration's Smart Pay 2 program. These services are vital to the operation of many district agencies. The original contract was for a base period from November 30th, 2008 through November 29th, 2012. Yes. Approval of this retroactive contract will allow the district to exercise the first three-year option period of this multi-year contract in the amount of $45 million. Again, this contract is via an MOU with the Department of Justice, so the $45 million is not expended at the outset. Rather, the contract operates by having participating district agencies encumber funds in advance and then make payments on a monthly basis as purchases are made. It is necessary that the option year be exercised to ensure continuity of services for our district agencies. I uh, so move the declaration, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. McDuffie. Discussion on the declaration? All those in favor of the declaration say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Medical On the uh, act, that's contract DCPO-2008-T-0076 dash 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 Emergency Approval Act of 2013. Mr. McDuffie? So move. Discussion? 
All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Next is contract number CW15344, Emergency Declaration Resolution of 2013, uh, PR 20-31. It's a contract with Aramark with regard to uh, food services at the uh, D.C. jail. Mr. Wells? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Today I'm moving contract number CW15344, Emergency Approval Resolution of 2013, PR 20-0032. This emergency was introduced by the chairman at the request of the mayor. This measure would approve a competitively bid multi-year contract between the Department of Corrections and Aramark Correctional Services, LLC, to operate and manage the Department of Corrections food service program at the district's central detention facility and the correctional treatment facility, CTF. There are six components to the service. These include operating an inmate food service at each facility to provide food for approximately 2,000 100 inmates at the Central Detention Facility and 700 inmates at CTF. <clears throat> Operating a cafeteria-style officer's dining room, food service at the Central de Detention Facility where the staff, contractor, or visitor can purchase with their own funds meals or food items a la carte. Equipment maintenance and repair provisions. Equipment replacement on a five-year um, amortization schedule. Provision of limited auxiliary food services and providing the services of consulting dietitian. Four proposals were received in response to the solicitation. Three were found to be in the competitive range. The incumbent contractor, Aramark Correctional Services, received the highest overall rated scores for its technical and price proposals. The total estimated amount for the multi-year contract is $12,657,000. If the council does not take action today, the proposed contract will be deemed disapproved on Saturday, February 16, 2013. I move the deck. Is there discussion on the deck? Declaration. Uh, again, this is contract number CW15344, Emergency Declaration Resolution of 2013. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. On, um, I move the measure. Which is PR 20 32. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. Uh, this brings us to um, reading and vote on temporary legislation. Item one, items one and two were withdrawn because the emergencies were not moved. Uh, and I am not going to move item five, which is the fire and EMS inaugural overtime clarification because the temporary is not necessary, the emergency will affect the pay. Um, so what we have before us and without objection will be moved in block is items three, Medical Marijuana Cultivation Center and Dispensary Location Restriction Temporary Amendment Act of 2013, and item four, Tax Revision Commission Report Extension and Procurement Streamlining Temporary Act of 2013. Uh, those three and four are moved together. Um, discussion. All those in favor of those two temporaries, say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. We'll now turn to under new business. Mr. We have Chairman, a, Mr. Chairman. Council Member Bowser. Before you move on to new business, may I be added to a bill that was introduced earlier, um, Council Member Che's uh, Nursing Act? Okay. Thank you. The Secretary will note that it was... Um, the bill that Council Member Che introduced with regard to um, nursing staffing standards. The Council Member Bowser is a co sponsor. <laughs> uh, we are now at new business, and uh, there's one item, and that's motion to reconsider reckless driving Congressional Review Emergency Amendment Act of 2013, Bill 20 4. Council Member Che. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today I'm moving to reconsider B20-4, the Reckless Driving Congressional Review Emergency Amendment Act of 2013, uh, for the purpose of tabling it. The Council has adopted multiple reckless uh, driving bills in the past year. On December 4th, the Council passed a permanent bill, B19-823, the Reckless Driving Amendment Act of 2012, on final reading. For the January 8th, 2013 legislative meeting, the General Counsel recommended that I move a Congressional Review emergency to extend the emergency and temporary bills until the permanent bill, 
completes the Congressional review period. After the Council approved that measure, the General Counsel concluded that this Congressional review emergency was, in fact, not needed. Therefore, the General Counsel now recommends that the Council move to reconsider the Congressional review emergency and to vote to table it indefinitely. Such action will prevent the Congressional review emergency from taking effect. So my motion now is to, to reconsider uh, B-20-4. All right. The um, motion has been made to table it. To, I, we have to, recon, we have to oh, bring it to I'm the sorry. table, and then we'll table it. Good point. So All right. The motion is to reconsider. And this matter, although uh, adopted, uh, has not been transmitted. Correct. And therefore, we're able to reconsider it. And the motion to reconsider is not debatable? Doesn't matter. Uh, if there's no objection. I think it's debatable. Is there any there's, objection to the no motion debate. to reconsider? Hearing none, it's uh, before us. Councilmember Che. Uh, now I move to table the bill. All right, the motion is to table it, which is not uh, uh, discussable. Debatable. All those in, thank you, <laughs> discussable. All those in favor of the motion to table the Reckless Driving Congressional Review Emergency Amendment Act of 2013, Bill 20-4, say aye. Aye. Opposed? The yeah, ayes have it. The bill is tabled. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Graham. I, I, may, I, may I ask that I be recorded as voting no on the Medical Marijuana Cultivation Center and Dispensary Location Restriction Temporary Amendment Act of 2013? Temporary slipped by, but our very alert staff has brought to my attention that I might want to be consistent, and I do want to be consistent. Uh, the cleaner way, I hate to say it, since it was moved in block, would be to um, Reconsider the two. If there's no objection, we will consider. Items three and four, uh, well, these are temporary bills on pages five and six. There's no objection. All right, what we have before us, I'll move them separately, is the Medical Marijuana Cultivation Center and Dispensary Location Restriction Temporary Amendment Act of 2013. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? No. I record Mr. Graham as voting no. Tax Revision Commission Report Extension and Procurement Streamlining Temporary Act of 2013. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it unanimously. I believe there's no further business before us. The time is now 1.58 in the afternoon, and this meeting is adjourned. Good burial.